Okay, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, dear colleagues, welcome to the um, Buceros Law School, to the sixth Hamburg International Arbitration Day, which we organize from the Center for International Dispute Resolution at Buceros Law School jointly with our friends from CAMCCBC, the leading Brazilian arbitration institution, the Hamburg Arbitration Circle, and the Rechtsstandort Hamburg as an uh, event preceding the CAMCCBC Hansa Premoot uh, for the Willem Sevismoot. Uh, for us, it's a great pleasure to have you here and also to have you online um, participating in this conference. We try every year to select some of the issues which are related to somehow the mood and also some of the issues which are pertinent in arbitration practice and where it would be nice to have a conference with a number of academics discussing the issues for a longer period, but not academics which are completely in an ivory tower, but mainly academics which have practical experience and look at it from both sides, from practice as well as from academia. Our topic this year, conflict of laws in arbitration, you could have a whole Hague lecture on that, like George Berman did. But we only have an afternoon, and therefore we had to make, had to make a selection of particular topics which are relevant. And one of the topics which would have been fitted in here well, we have used that for another conference which will take place on Thursday, again with Brazilian friends, uh, on insolvency and arbitration, where we also have a section on conflict of laws. But today we concentrate on a number of conflict of law issues related to arbitration, related to the various issues in arbitration, starting with the arbitration agreement, uh, going over the arbitrator's contract, and then also some procedural questions. And for that, we are very glad to have, again, a very international audience. We have speakers from Brazil. We have speakers from Norway, which teach in Norway, but come from Italy, have spent some time in Germany. At least I assume that, given the perfect German they speak. And we also have speakers from Serbia. Unfortunately, it's pandemic time. That means not all speakers will be here. We have some speakers who have to participate from home. And uh, we are very glad that they, despite being affected, take the opportunity or take the time to present and participate at least virtually. With that, I wish us all a very nice conference. We have sufficient time to discuss issues, both from within the audience here, but also those of you who are participating virtually, we try to take your questions and include them into the discussion. With that, I pass on to my dear friend, Eleonora Coelho from CAMCCBC, who made it all the way from Brazil here. And we are very glad that we organize that jointly with you every year. And we're looking forward to a number of further successful conferences than probably, hopefully, without COVID. Eleonora, thank you for coming. Thank you, Stefan. Good afternoon to everyone. My name is Eleonora Coelho, as Stefan said. I'm the CAMCCBC uh, president, and I'm very honored to be here today. My first professional international trip after COVID. Um, the weather is not as, as I expected, but uh, I'm really glad to be here at Buceros with all of you. Uh, I'd like to thank Buceros Law School for uh, having this event and for discussing such relevant themes. So you can always count on us, Stefan. We think this is really important for the arbitral community. Also, I'd like to thank Professor Stefan Kroll, whose dedication is enormous. He has made a gigantic work for arbitration, not only here in Germany, but for all over the world, uh, with the pre now with the IS, with Boost Series. So thank you very much. <laughs> 
I would like to express my gratitude to Elk Humbeck also uh, for all the firms that uh, have contributed to the uh, Premud, the Hamburg Premud. Without your help, we wouldn't be able to enjoy such an incredible event and week. I would also like to thank the panelists for making this event possible. We would haven't be here today if it wasn't for your availability and for uh, your effort to the community. It is indeed an honor to be standing among you all. Last but not least, I'd like to thank all the students, lawyers, and arbitrators that are watching us. I hope you can enjoy the event and absorb as much as possible of the knowledge that will be shared here today. For more than 11 years, we have been sponsoring teams, organizing premutes in Sao Paulo and Hamburg, and supporting the Vismut competition, and I can say, it is always worth it. This year's Hamburg Premud received a total of 119 teams registered, represented 107 universities from 38 countries, from which we selected the participating teams. It's huge. The Vismut and the Premud make a solid foundation for our careers and represent an amazing opportunity for developing the oral skills that will make you a good professional in the near future. Although we have the privilege of being here today, the Hamburg Premud will be held virtually again this year. The fact that pandemic created lots of obstacles for all of us is no longer news to share, but I think hopefully it's going to be uh, normal again. Gladly, during the last year, the arbitral community has adapted and evolved to respond to challenges and to new, to the new demands. The Comes CBC has done that. For example, contrary to what we would have expected, after the outbreak of the pandemic, the numbers of proceedings have increased and we managed to administer them all virtually. Uh, we had an increase of almost 10% in the num number of cases and from 2020 to 2021, an increase of 22% in the numbers. We have received a total number of 120 new cases uh, last year. When the pandemic hit Brazil in March 2020, the Secretariat was efficient in virtualizing the management of all cases in less than 48 hours. After that, we adapted our structure to hold the hearings virtually, and we created a new cybersecurity protocol and all protocols to ensure the good administration uh, virtual administration of proceedings. The chains were not restricted to technical aspects of the conduction of proceedings. On 2021, CAMCCBC launched its expedited proceedings through administrative uh, resolution with the objective of providing an even more efficient uh, form of administering proceedings. Another major advance was the draft, of, the draft of the updated version of our rules, the CUMC CBC arbitration rules. They were submitted to public consultation last year, and we're going to have news very soon. Who knows another case of the mood, Stefan? <laughs> All of these improvements are direct results of the dedication of CUMC CBC team, which I thank very much here today. So, Today we are going to discuss the main topics related to conflict of laws. Taking the look at Latin America perspective, the importance of the European law, the mandatory rules in arbitration, the conflict issues relation to arbitration's contract, and overview of the law governing the arbitration agreement. All these subjects are crucial, not only for the purpose of the academic debate, but also for the development of arbitration and of course, your future as professional in the field of arbitration. That being said, I hope you can enjoy uh, as much as possible, not only today's panel, but the Hamburg Prem Mood, and hope to see you soon in person. Without further ado, uh, I wish you all a great event. So our first speaker will join us virtually from Brazil. It's uh, Nadia de Arroyo. She is an associate professor at the Pontifical Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro, where she teaches private international law. 
She holds a PhD in international law from the University of Sao Paulo and a master in comparative law from George Washington University. Her research and publications primary focus on international contract law, international commercial arbitration, international judicial cooperation, and international family law. She's a member of the Permanent Review Court of the Mercosur and a member of the Brazilian National Group of the Permanent Court of Arbitration at The Hague. Nade is the author of one of the leading publications on private international law in Brazil, I don't even try to pronounce it properly, which is already in its ninth edition. She has participated in several legislative projects at the Hague Conference on Private International Law, including the specialist group whose work led to the conclusion of the 2019 Hague Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Judgments in Civil and Commercial Matters. So she has also acted as Brazilian delegate to a number of other international events harmonizing laws in both um, family law issues as well as international uh, commercial law issues. Before founding her own law firms in 2012, Nadia was the chief advisor for the constitutional appeals to the district attorney office in Rio de Janeiro and a district attorney at the Rio de Janeiro State Appellate Court. Uh, I probably could go on with your CV for quite some time, Nadia, and we would, love, would have loved to have you here in Hamburg uh, in person, but we are very grateful that you are participating virtually. The floor is yours, and we are listening, or we are looking forward to hearing about conflict of law issues and arbitration in Latin America. Thank you very much. Well, good morning to everybody. It is morning in Rio de Janeiro, and I know you are after lunch now in Hamburg. It is a pleasure to participate in this conference at the Buceres Law School in furthering arbitration knowledge uh, to the students and to the audience and to the professors and to everybody. It's a very important dialogue. I thank Professor Stephen Crow for his very kind introduction and Eleonora for, from Come CCBC for her words on the Brazilian aspects of arbitration. And I know come CCBC is striving in this new world after the pandemic. And I will try to share my screen. And I hope you see that, yes. It's interesting that I can see the floor. And my topic today is Question, conflicts of law questions in arbitration, a Latin American perspective. Well, while adjudicating a case, an arbitral tribunal may also deal with conflict of law issues concerning the applicable law in the international contract at hand. It's very common and when you have an international setting for arbitration that in the very beginning, these issues come forward. And in this presentation, I'll try to focus on the Latin American heritage and specifically in the countries of Mercosur. When I'm invited to a conference on Latin America, I'm always careful because I do not know the laws of all Latin American countries, but as I've been been working on Mercosur issues for a long time, and as an arbitrator to the, tri the revision tribunal of Mercosur, at least the other laws of the four countries of, of three other countries of Mercosur, because we are four, Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay, that I can, I can speak of. So I focus the questions on the applicable law and what can the arbitral tribunal do when there's no choice of law in the contract in these four countries. But I have to say that the rest of Latin America, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, Bolivia, Venezuela, they, and I don't know if I listed all, but they all 
go in the same direction. They are all civil law countries. They have all been participating for a very long time in the efforts of multilateral agreements in the region. And I will try to touch upon some of them. Uh, in the Mercosur countries, the principal party autonomies is well established now, but this was not the case for many years. And I will try to give you a little bit of understanding of what happens in the past. And I will also analyze what the arbitral tribunal can do in the absence of choice. We, when we study party autonomy, when we study international contracts, we always think, well, there will be a choice of law. That is not the case every time. Many times the contracts do not have a chosen law and that provides an issue for the tribunal to decide. Well, going a little bit back in the history I'm very proud to say that Latin America was the first continent to embrace multilateral negotiations on private international law. And that was done by the Treaty of Lima of 1878, even prior to the Hague Convention of Private International Law, to the Hague Conference of Private International Law in 1893. Uh, still in the 19th centuries, the countries of the South, mainly Argentina, Uruguay, and Paraguay, held a conference call and finished the Treaties of Montevideo, also a landmark in private international law for the region, and that was still the rules for Argentina, Uruguay, and Paraguay for a long time. It was not until recently that this has changed. The Lima Treaty was not very, did not have go through with the countries, it was not widely accepted, and the efforts of the region continue, and a special group of jurists had this Lafayette Pereira's project on a code of private international law in 1912. This did not go forward because of First World War and only in the late 20s with the Bustamante Code, a real code of private international law was enacted in Latin America and it's still in force today for more than 16 countries. And these international conventions uh, went gradually into accepting party autonomy. The principal party autonomy in Latin America was not very well seen in the beginning of the 20th century because Latin America, and especially Uruguay, Paraguay, and Argentina, they received a lot of inputs and they did not like the fact that when you have damage on transportation, the applicable law would be that of the seller, and the seller most of the time try to impose a clause with exclusion of damages or with a ceiling for the damages. So it is not a surprise that most countries in Latin America were against the party autonomy principle. And we see with the Treaty of Lima that the main rule was the rule where the contract was signed and the treaties of Montevideo were the rule of performance, which is still the main rule for Paraguay, Uruguay, and Argentina. The Bustamante Code were on the side of the, again, the law where the con contract was finished. And finally, in 1994, we had CDIP 5. CDIP stands for Inter American Conference, Inter American Conference specialized in private international law. This was an initiative of the OAS that in the 70s and on, instead of reforming the Bustamante Code, 
adopted a way a more similar to the Hague Conference style with specific conventions for each topic. And in the fifth meeting in 1994 in Mexico, the Inter-American Convention on the Law applicable to international contracts was finished. Well, this convention, although widely recognized as an important document, was not very successful in being accepted by the countries. There was a very low level of acceptance. Only two countries ratified the Mexico Convention, Mexico, of course, and Venezuela, which at the time, with the leading of Professor Pararanguren, which ended up as a judge in the International Court of Justice, had a very developed way of looking at private international law and helped the negotiations. And he was chairman of one of the committees of the CT5. Thus, I think he was able to convince his government of the importance of the convention. But that was not the case with the other countries. Their main features of the conventions are important to convey here because Although the convention was not adopted, its provisions become a reference to other international initiatives and furthermore, an inspiration to the change of legislation in the region. And that's what I think is the main heritage of the Inter-American Convention on the law applicable to international contracts. It really helped change the mood change legislation that would not allow parties to choose the law they wish for the international contract. I have here just the main articles of the convention. I want to focus on Article 9, the default rule, and it was also the first time that in Latin America, instead of using as a default rule the place where the contract was signed, or the place of performance, we move towards the most closely connected ties. And this was also an inspiration, not only of American principles, North American principles, but of the Rome Convention of 1980 that in Europe ended up being now Regulation 593. Also very important to the convention was the use of Lex Mercatoria, the possibility to use other things than just the law of one country. And Article 10 was very much fought by Professor Junger that was present in the conference. And it was his goal to have the provision that would allow the use also of guideline, customs, and principles of commercial law as well as commercial practice and issues in the applicable law of international contracts. Mm. Well, the Mercosur area, the idea of integration between Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, and Paraguay uh, started in 1991 with the first, the treaty. And all the other legislations were called protocols, but in fact are as conventions. Uh, in the 90s, there's a group of convention on international cooperation, the Las Lenas Protocol on responsibility for accidents on the road, the San Luis Protocol. And in the arbitration area, we have the Mercosur Agreement on international commercial arbitration 90, in 1998. It is enforced in the four countries and it applies Article 1 for all international contracts among private parties that we use arbitration as their, as their means to disputes, to solutions to their disputes. It applies to private parties, to businesses, and it's focused on international commercial arbitration. 
its scope is as long as a party has a habitual residence or place of business in a Mercosur contract, country, or the contract has a contact with a Mercosur country, it can be used. But it allows the parties to opt out. Although there are five points where the protocols could be used, it always allows the party to opt out. I don't know why the Mercosur agreement is not most, most widely known. I do not have information on whether it is used, but it's certainly a way of seeing how arbitration in these very complex cases can be dealt with. It has, I, I would not touch upon the whole protocol, but it has very interesting provisions for all the conflict matters that we are always asking ourselves, how would an international arbitral tribunal deal with it? And I don't see these rules in other laws and regulations of international arbitration centers. So I think, although I know the Mercosur agreement is not widely used, it could be studied more in depth and help prepare for such cases. Um, it, for example, one issue that comes up very often, and there I have heard a lot of different types of answers, is what law and if a different law applies to the arbitration agreement, especially if there was no choice of law in the contract. Parties are not very careful when negotiating their contracts to specifically add a clause on the applicable law for the arbitration agreement and maybe the same or a different one for the substance of the international contract. So the Mercosur agreement has in Article 5 a rule that says that the arbitration agreement is autonomous in relation to the international contract. Thus, even if the contract is deemed to be null and void, the arbitration agreement will stand. Also, it has two articles that I put here for us to see on formal validity and on capacity. The very current depassage situations we deal with when we need to decide which law applies to the contract to the capacity of the parties and to the validity of the document. In the Mercosur area, thus for international contracts, I think we have two scenarios. First, where the parties have selected the law of the country. Of course, if they use the possibility of choosing, and they have chosen the applicable law, the arbitration agreement will respect that and will apply the selected law. Article 10 of the Mercosur Arbitration Agreement provides for that, saying that the parties can choose according to the private international rules they have, or as well as the law of international commerce. And I will show to you in the next minutes that today, all four countries of Mercosur allows party to choose the law they want for the contracts and body in their legislation. On the other hand, Article 10 also provides when the parties have not selected the law of the contract. In that situation, the arbitral tribunal can use also the rules of private international law or the law of international commerce. What the law of international common is, is not very clear from the Mercosur agreement, but maybe we can go back to the Inter-American Convention and use Professor Junger's idea of Article 10. I think that will be a nice interaction between these two documents. In, although 
arbitral tribunal, tribunal can use either private international rules or the law of international commerce. Article 10 gives the tribunal total discretion to decide which way, which path it will follow. And that is also very interesting to let the tribunal decide according to what it has in front of them, which path they will choose. But there is an understanding that they will have to decide between these two. <laughs> so how, what is the current scenario in the laws, the private international rules of each of the countries of Mercosul, which I told you before, they did not accept party autonomy in the past. Well, Argentina has changed its civil code in 2014 and fully embraced party autonomy. Brazil has a specific law of arbitration that in Article 2 fully embrace party autonomy for contracts that will later be solved by arbitration. I have to say here that our private international law, law which applies for contract that will be decided by a judicial way, is still not clear. And I would dare to say is even against Autonomy. However, the principle has eroded, the, the prohibition has eroded in the latest years. And recently, the Superior Court of Justice, our court that deals with federal legislation, has a case, has case law decided in favor of the principle. So I believe it's fair to say Although the law in Brazil has not changed, it is going to change their projects in our legislative system. And at least at the courts, there's an understanding that if the parties have chosen the law for the contract, that would be respected. But we do not have to worry about that in arbitration because the law of arbitration in Article 2 expressly say that the parties can choose the law to the contract. Paraguay, has adopted a new statute in 2015 for international contracts based on the Hague principles on choice of law for international contracts and also embrace party autonomy. And finally, Uruguay in 2020, finally, with a new law on private international law, embrace party autonomy. So it's fair to say that in the Mercosur countries, all of them embrace party autonomy. Well, when what do we do in the absence of choice? What is interesting is that the also recent law of Argentina, Paraguay, and Uruguay allows the tribunal to make this decision based on what it deems more appropriate to the case. Paraguay does not have such a rule it goes to the conflicts rules of the most closely connected. And Brazil does not have a direct rule that would allow the arbitral tribunal deciding which way to go. Thus, the law of introduction would apply. But it's interesting, this development in Argentina and Uruguay that allows the tribunal to select the law in conformity with the criteria it considers more appropriate. And it's certainly in line with Article 10 of the Mercosur Agreement. Well, I'm heading to my conclusions. I hope that my timing is within what the conference expected. I hope to have time for questioning, but I can say Latin America has a strong tradition in establishing common rules of private international law. That party autonomy has moved from being prohibited in most countries towards totally being accepted in new legislation, 
the Inter-American Convention, although not ratified in Latin American countries, helps the trend towards the acceptance of the principle in all new legislation. And in the Mercosur area, international, the Mercosur Agreement provides a very interesting set of rules for private international law, although it has been seldom been used in the region. And also I have not heard many literature uh, in law concerning the agreement. In the 90s, it made a fuss and, and it was highly regarded as a new thing. But since then, and I'm, it has died out and I'm not sure it has been used very much. And, but Mercosur countries have allowed arbitral tribunal to choose the applicable law in the absence of choice. And I can say that this rule is very open and it leaves the tribunal to decide in a manner it deems more appropriate. So I think in the end of the day, they benefit from the rules of the Mercosur agreement. And Brazil has still a lot to learn, has no specific rule. And I'm sad to say is in a way an exception to this trend, but I'm very, hopeful that our legislation will change. There are a number of projects in the legislative right now for that. And I hope that in the near future, we'll be able to tell a different story. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nadia, for that excellent presentation of the law of Latin America. I would already have a number of questions, but what we decided to have the two sessions on the uh, applicable law to the merits together and then have a joint session later on for questions. Those of you who participate virtually, you can already send the questions you have to Nadia um, to, um, into the chat and we will later read it out. Now we have the European view on primary the law applicable to the merits, and it's my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, my colleague and friend, Reimer Wolf. He is assistant professor at the University of Marburg, uh, is the author of the very well-known, um, or not the author, the editor of the very well-known uh, New York Convention commentary, um, and has, is a prolific writer, has been involved in a number of events in Germany, including uh, he's a member of the task force which is dealing with the revision of the German arbitration law. And last but not least, he's probably one of the persons I've spent most of the time with over the last two months, because he is now the vice president of the German Arbitration Institute. And uh, my wife sometimes gets jealous that I speak more with him than I speak with her. So we have several mood sessions, uh, several sessions on via Zoom or whatever per day. Reimer, it's a pleasure that you nevertheless found the time to come to Hamburg, and we're looking forward to hearing your views on conflict of law issues in arbitration with a certain focus on the law applicable to the merits from the European perspective. The floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Stefan, for that kind introduction. Thank you for having me here. And it was actually not a joke that we spent most of our time together. Just to give you a short impression, the last email that I sent out last night has been somewhat past 11 o'clock p.m. And the first video session that we had this morning was 7 a.m. So, <laughs> and sometimes it's four to five a day. So I always know what Stefan is wearing that day before he switches on the camera. <laughs> so I'm privileged to see you in person today. Thank you, thank you for this. Um, I have the honor to speak to you about conflict of law questions in arbitration and specifically the relevance of European law. Um, I will primarily focus on the relation between the so-called Rome 1 regulation and um, arbitration, arbitral proceedings. So the question 
to what extent does the Rome 1 regulation influence the law applicable to the merits in an arbitral proceeding. And I understand that not every one of you is actually from a European Union country, and that is why I will try to, well, provide you with some basics in a first step, try to guide you through the different regimes um, under the Rome 1 regulation and in arbitration uh, in a first step, and after that, we will look into the specific question to what extent does the Rome 1 regulation apply in arbitral proceedings yeah, for identifying the proper law to be applicable <clears throat> to the merits. Um, there are a number of, well, text instances where we'll, we'll look into. Um, the more exciting part will be the next where we um, look into the more substantive question whether uh, Rome 1 should apply or does apply in arbitral proceedings. And I will, well, comment on all of those arguments that are in made that are, that have been made in favor of such applicability one by one, and that will be the the last part of uh, today's presentation. Um, I guess I can switch it with this, right? I can. Great. So I have brought with me. That's relatively boring, and I have to excuse going back. This is the only um, picture that you will see in this entire presentation. <laughs> yeah? This is the, the seal of the university. This is quite old and um, enjoy, so the rest will just be text. <laughs> Normally I would be killed, but I have some, some distance here to the audience, which is, which is good. So this is the first wonderful text slide. This first wonderful text slide provides you with actually the choice of law provision applicable in arbitration on the left side and um, the respective provision of Rome 1 of the Rome 1 regulation on the right side. Um, for the, since we're discussing that in a European context um, and we do not have unified arbitration law in the European Union, um, I have relied on the so-called model law, on the um, UNCITRAL model law on international commercial arbitration that's abridged here with ML. So every, every time ML shows up, that is the UNCITRAL model law on international commercial arbitration. And Article 28 of that model law defines the rules applicable to substance of the dispute and says, well, the arbitral tribunal shall decide the dispute in accordance with such rules of law as are chosen by the parties as applicable to the substance of the dispute. So, and on the right-hand side, the Rome 1 regulation which has a more complex name, in fact, so that's likewise an abbreviation, that is the Regulation EC number 593 of 2008 of the European Parliament and of the Council of 17 June 2008 on the law applicable to contractual obligations, Rome 1. And I'll refer to that as Rome 1. You'll find that on the right side, on the right side of the slide here. <clears throat> and it um, is... Um, its heading reads freedom of choice and the contract shall be governed by the law chosen by the parties. And at first sight, and that's also what the heading of the slide says, that reads pretty well similar. Yeah, so the tribunal shall decide in accordance with the rules of law chosen by the parties and um, the contract shall be governed by the law chosen by the parties. So there doesn't seem to be much difference. However, if we take a closer look, then we see that Article 28 of the Model Law speaks of rules of law in its first paragraph, while Article 3 of Rome 1 speaks of law. And law is a legal regime of a given country, and rules of law could be a given legal regime of a country, but could also be something different. So that could also um, be something that is international in nature, for example. So the CISG, if it doesn't apply by virtue of um, states having become member to the um, CISG, that could be a rule of law. Or principles could be a rule of law where parties agree on principles of international commercial contracts, for example, or UNIDRA principles or whatever uh, to, to govern their, their contract. That is also possible. Or they invent rules of law on their own. Yeah, so that all works under Article 28. 
that does not work under Article 3 of the Rome 1 regulation. So um, before a state court in the European Union, you cannot choose anything else but the legal order of a given country. Yeah? And that's it. So it's just law and not rules of law. And that becomes even, even broader in, the, in, the, in Article 28 of the model law. If we look into the third paragraph, which is printed below, um, the arbitral tribunal shall decide ex equo et bono if the parties have expressly authorized it to do so. And that tells us that it's not necessarily a rule of law in the sense of this is a legal regime that applies, but that can also be um, a, re a, re a regime of, of fairness, yeah? of, well, the, the tribunal shall decide as it deems fit, yeah? what it finds best, what it feels is most suitable, ex equo et bono. Yeah, so even that is included, yeah, and that is much broader, and that, that is much beyond um, what a state court in the European Union could apply. So that's the first part of the story with Article 28 model law and Article Rome 1 regulation. We have, in addition, a number of rules on what I've called here weak party protection. So in Rome 1, there are a number of specific contracts set out which have one weaker party as a party, um, a consumer, for example, or a taker of insurance, or um, an employee. And those weaker parties are protected by Rome 1. And Article 6 protects consumers, Article 7, the takers of insurance, and Article 8, um, employees. Yeah, and they benefit from those provisions to an extent that um, the parties to such specific weak party contracts cannot choose another law than that one that is um, advantages to, to that weak party. To keep it short, it's a little bit more complex in reality, but that's, that's the core, I believe. And you'll see on the left-hand side of this slide, nothing. So in arbitration, especially under the model law, there is nothing on weak parties. And if we continue to um, which law shall apply if the parties haven't made a choice. Yeah, so that what we just discussed have been set, uh, um, settings of uh, choice of law, broad, broad liberty of the parties to choose the applicable law with the exceptions of those weak party contracts. If the parties have failed to make um, a choice of law, then under Article 28, second paragraph, the arbitral tribunal shall apply the law determined by the conflict of law rules which it considers applicable. So that is a very, well, let's say, generic phrase. While in the Rome 1 regulation, again, here it's not the full text, it's just a summary, there are more specific criteria to determine the applicable law in case the parties didn't make a choice of law. And that is, in particular, what Article 4 of the Rome 1 regulation sets out, and that boils down, again, a bit simplified here, that boils down to the place of characteristic performance and or the closest connection of the contract. And that's the law that shall apply under Article 4, Rome 1 regulation. Plus, of course, those laws determined under the provisions on weak party contracts that we just discussed a second ago. So the, um, the difference between model law, the arbitration regime on the one side, and Rome 1, the regime before state courts on the other side, is even bigger um, beyond choice of law than it is within choice of law. Um, and that is essentially the question that we are dealing with, with, with. So if the result is that the Rome 1 regulation applies in arbitral proceedings, then you can basically forget everything that you've seen on the left-hand side. So the entire Article 28 model law um, thing would be overridden by uh, the Rome 1 regulation. There's hardly anything remaining. Yeah? Since the differences are, well, of, of, um, of greater nature. <clears throat> so the question, the key question indeed is, does the Rome 1 regulation apply in arbitral proceedings? Oops, yeah. Does it apply in arbitral proceedings? And um, there are indeed a number of um, occurrences or a number of regulations within the Rome 1 regulation which could 
answer this question. So the first thing as a lawyer, look into the law. What, what does the law provide? Um, does the Rome 1 regulation want to apply or intend to apply, or is it designed to apply in arbitrary proceedings? We do have in the scope of application in Article 1 um, of the Rome 1 regulation a provision that excludes certain topics from the scope of application. So the first paragraph reads that the convention, that the regulation shall apply in situations involving a conflict of law to contractual obligations in civil and commercial matters. That seems to be a perfect fit. But continue reading, second paragraph. Um, excluded, shall be excluded from the scope of this regulation, mm -hmm -hmm, blah, 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 and then E, arbitration agreements and agreements on the choice of court. So arbitration agreements as such are explicitly not covered by the, by the scope of application of uh, the Rome 1 regulation. We do, however, not really discuss arbitration agreements. We do discuss the question which law applies to the merits um, in a setting in which the arbitral tribunal decides a dispute brought before it by the parties. So that is certainly not the question of um, the law governing the arbitration agreement. Um, but we could uh, uh, draw or make an argument based on Article 1.2e, uh, Rome 1, and say, hey, if it explicitly excludes arbitration agreements, it is apparently aware of the thing called arbitration, yeah? And if it just excludes the arbitration agreement and is silent on um, the, the, the arbitral proceedings and the law governing um, substance in arbitration, then this is maybe a good argument to say that should be in. Yeah? Arbitration agreements are out and the law on substance should be in under Article 1, um, second paragraph of the Rome 1 regulation. Um, this could indeed be an argument to that effect. However, if we continue reading, we do read in recital number seven that the substantive scope um, and the provisions of this, re this regulation should be consistent with the Brussels I regulation. The Brussels I regulation um, is the regulation governing the court, inter alia governing the court jurisdiction within the European Union. Um, the Brussels I regulation, as it deals with court jurisdiction, apparently only applies to state court proceedings and not to arbitration. So this is evident at this stage. So recital 7 could be read as an indication saying if Rome 1 is modeled along the line of Brussels I, yeah, or Brussels I recast, then this may indicate that it's restricted to state courts and not to arbitral proceedings. Continue reading recital number six. The proper functioning of the internal market creates a need in order to improve predictability of the outcome of litigation. Uh, that's again more an indication that it's res restricted to state court proceedings and not to arbitration. Recital number 37. Considerations of public interest justifying giving the courts of the member states this and that. Yeah. Explicit, explicit reference to the courts of the member, uh, member states. Um, at, in other recitals, we have references to courts or tribunals of member states. Yeah? However, we know from the jurisdiction, from the case law of the European Court of Justice, um, that um, court or tribunal of a member state, at least for um, purposes of Article 267, uh, the request for a preliminary ruling by the European Court of Justice does not comprise arbitral tribunals. And so an arbitral tribunal can never submit a question of law to the European Court of Justice. Yeah? This is restricted under 267 um, of the uh, Treaty for the Functioning of the European Union to state courts. Yeah? So again, this would more be an indication against um, reading uh, well, a broad scope of applicability into the Rome 1 regulation. That has been the relatively boring part of the presentation. That's just reading and the outcome is, well, you can read it that way, but the better grounds speak uh, in favor of reading it, well, in a, in a narrow fashion. Let us look more into the arguments which could be brought beyond the mere wording in favor of a broad reading of the Rome 1 regulation. And there are essentially three that hold some convincingness. The first is 
we need to protect weak parties. If we have consumers, if we have takers of insurance, if we have employees, yeah, their need of protection cannot depend on whether they are before a state court or before an arbitral tribunal. They need protection. Yeah? And one, mean, one means of protection is, um, the, are the mandatory rules on choice of law as contained in the, in the Rome 1 regulation. If we uh, leave it with Article 28 of the model law, there is no protection left um, at all, and this is a, um, an, an unbearable result. Second argument in favor of the applicability of the Rome 1 regulation to arbitration, um, that the Rome 1 regulation shall be comprehensively applicable. So the idea is to have a, well, a unified, a really unified um, regime of conflict of law yeah, throughout the entire European Union, applicable before every single state court and be applicable before every single arbitral tribunal. Yeah, that is um, the, 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 the dearest wish, I believe, of everyone who does uh, unification of law, yeah, to have a comprehensively applicable um, um, stipulation that applies everywhere. And the last, and that goes line in, or hand in hand with the second argument, is that arbitral tribunals and state courts are deemed to have um, an equivalent standing. So um, the national legislators um, assume and have, have indeed um, stressed that arbitration is not a, well, let's say a second class legal protection mechanism, but it's on equal footing with state courts. Yeah, and if it's on equal footing on state courts, you can make an argument to say, hey, if that is essentially the same, then we apply essentially the same rules, including Rome 1. These are what I find the, well, the, the best arguments that are brought for a broad reading of Rome 1 um, that includes arbitration. However, none of those is convincing. Uh, I will discuss that I will not close here, but I will, but I will discuss that um, step by step, argument by argument, starting with the last, then second, and then the first one. Um, starting with the last, um, equal standing of arbitral tribunals and state courts. Um, there is some truth in that argument. Yeah? It is true that there is that the outcome of an arbitral tribunal of an arbitral proceeding um, is an arbitral award, and this award um, 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 becomes res judicata yeah, and can become the basis of enforcement, and that the state lends its or the states lend their powers to the enforcement of arbitral awards. Yeah? So all of that is true, and it is also true that this works only in light of the fact that there are procedural guarantees beforehand. So it would be unthinkable to have a procedure that ends with something that becomes res judicata, but that does not guarantee or that does not contain um, um, basic guarantees of a fair proceeding. Yeah. So that is connected. Only something that is a proper proceeding can result in a document that becomes res judicata. Yeah. So that much is true. And it is true that you can't, that's one of the reasons, by the way, why, why you can't expedite arbitral proceedings too much since you need to uh, grant the right to be heard yeah, if and since the outcome shall become res judicata. Um, however, as true as this is, this has nothing to do with the standard for decision on the merits. So it's one thing to grant the right to be heard, and it's one thing to have a fair proceeding, and it's an entirely separate thing to identify the standard under which the decision is to be made. So regardless on what that standard is, um, the parties are to be given the right to be heard, the parties are to be provided with a fair proceeding, and there is nothing that, well, implies that the same um, rules um, shall be applied for um, arbitral decision-making as compared to decision-making before state courts. Um, the second, or what, let, me, let me return, let me add one thing here. And that becomes even more apparent if, if you look into the specifics of Article 28 of um, the model law again. Yeah? So there is um, 
if you recall that, in the third paragraph, a provision under which arbitral tribunals can be empowered to decide ex equo at bono. Yeah? That's explicitly in there. So you can an arbitral tribunal, you can free an arbitral tribunal from the obligation to look into the law and can it just make, have, have it make a decision um, um, on grounds of fairness and, 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 and justice. And um, if that is part and parcel yeah, of arbitration, that you are not that strictly bound to the law, then it's obviously not the idea behind that, that the same set of rules for determining the applicable law before arbitral tribunals apply. So moving to the next closely connected argument, and that is the comprehensive applicability of Rome 1. So the idea, if I may um, um, repeat that, well, it's, wouldn't it be great to have a all comprehensive regulation that governs everything that um, is to be, well, that, 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 that relates to um, conflict of law rules in the, in the contractual realm within Europe. Um, as charming as this proposal sounds, um, it's likewise not really convincing. And this becomes apparent if you look into different mechanisms of resolving a dispute. So imagine two parties, cross-border dispute, have a, well, are not uh, in agreement, and they, they try to resolve the dispute. Most disputes will likely be resolved by way of a settlement. Yeah, the parties negotiate, they find some kind of commercial solution, and they settle their dispute. No one will ask whether such settlement is in conformity with Rome 1. It's just a settlement between the parties. Yeah? The parties have not yet advanced to an extent that the question of applicable law comes up at all in that, in that situation. Same if the parties employ the services of a mediator. Yeah? The mediator assists the parties to reach an amicable solution. Yeah? If he is successful or if he, she is successful and the parties um, come to a settlement, again, no one will ask, does this settlement comply with Rome 1? Uh, this question just, just doesn't come up. Arbit uh, mediation is heading for win-win uh, settings where the parties advance their interests. It's not heading towards a Rome 1 compatible result. Yeah. Same for conciliation. Yeah. If this conciliation reaches a result, no one will ask, does that apply or does, is that in conformity with Rome 1? Yeah. And if you approach it from that angle, you'll suddenly see that um, there are apparently quite a number of, if not most, instances in which dispute resolution mechanisms um, do not even touch on conflict of law questions. Yeah. So the applicability, a, a all comprehensive applicability of conflict of law questions, um, as this argument goes, is, is out of reach in any event. So the question is, should, that, should it at least yeah, um, um, include arbitration? Um, but what for? So most of the dispute resolution mechanisms are out in any event, and if arbitration allows for, well, other means of dispute resolution, for example, again, the ex equo et bono decision, yeah, that is evidently outside conflict of law questions, and there is actually no need to put it in at that stage. Yeah, so this exemplifies even more that the idea behind, of arbit behind arbitration is broader than just applying the law that a state court should apply. Another argument in the context of comprehensive applicability is um, Article 25 of the Rome 1 regulation. That is a very technical provision that deals with the relationship with other already existing international conventions and which in its second paragraph determines that um, the Rome 1 regulation shall, as between member states, take precedence over conventions concluded exclusively between two or more of them insofar as such convention, conventions concern matters governed by this regulation. And such a um, previously concluded um, convention in the sense of Article 25 of the Rome 1 regulation is the European Convention on Commercial Arbitration from 1961. And under this 1961 European Convention, um, the parties are essentially free to determine the choice 
uh, the applicable law by, by their choice, and um, that that choice also includes exactly what Bono decisions as set out in Article 7, second paragraph of this European Convention. Um, and this European Convention um, um, has 17 out of 26 EU member states as a party. So even if the idea had been, well, to extend the scope of Rome 1 to all member states and to all arbitral proceedings run in all member states, then this would, at, at the latest stage, fail here with Article 25 in connection with Article 7 of the European Convention, since at least to the extent that states are involved which are party to the European Convention, the European Convention would um, override the rules under Rome 1. Yeah, so here at the latest, the idea of a all comprehensive applicability um, fails. Moving to the last argument, uh, we need to protect the weak parties. Um, that's maybe the strongest argument in favor of a broad reading of Rome 1. Yeah, what about the parties in need of protection? Is that need really, can that depend on, um, on the forum in which the dispute is being decided? First thing is, or the first idea is, or the first, um, um, the, the, the first statement is that the applicability of Rome 1 would not at all protect weak parties since um, let us look into Rome 1. What, what does Rome 1 determine? Rome 1 is on conflict of law rules. Rome 1 does not contain um, rules on substance. Yeah, so no law on the merits is contained in Rome 1. It's just rules on the applicability of um, substantive rules. And it is entirely undisputed that in arbitral proceedings, um, the parties under Article 28 of the model law can waive mandatory rules under their uh, in, uh, uh, under the law yeah, that is applicable. So a standard example would be um, in the B2B um, context, um, the, the review of general terms and conditions in Germany. There is a very strict, well, jurist, uh, very strict case law on, on such review yeah, that the, the courts um, 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 have been holding over the last several years. Um, that is mandatory, obviously, but in arbitration, the parties can agree to take those rules out. So they can agree to, agree, uh, to, to have German law applicable yeah, with the exception of B2B general terms and conditions review rules. And that is undisputed, that works. Yeah. If, however, you can take out mandatory parts of the applicable law in arbitration, yeah, what sense then does it make to have mandatory rules for the choice of law? Yeah, if the law where you point to yeah, is, yeah, is in your hands, yeah, you, you, then you are pointed, mandatorily pointed to the law of the state A, yeah, but you are free again to, to, to modify the law of this given state. So it doesn't make much sense to um, uphold mandatory conflict of law rules um, if the uh, law thus determined um, is deemed to be waivable in, well, not in its entirety, but in large part. Second thing, um, even if that worked, and again, an even if argument here, even if that worked, um, the entire idea behind Rome 1 is uniformity, yeah, and its protection of weak parties, and it's um, that a court that is um, um, concerned with a question under those weak party contracts and is unsure how to decide has to ask the European Court of Ju Justice for a preliminary ruling. So it is bound by that case law and it must um, 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 ask for such preliminary rulings. That, however, doesn't work in arbitration. So this entire mechanism on tying the, the, um, the, the fora uh, to the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice doesn't work. So, and that is why the entire Rome 1 regulation does, even if it applied mandatorily, um, doesn't really work to protect the weak parties. Um, and there's actually no need to do so, since there are other mechanisms to, um, to protect weak parties in arbitration. 
um, mainly two of them. One are the so-called overriding mandatory provisions. Second is that any award must comply with public policy, including European public policy. I will go into a little more depth um, as to both of those arguments here. The first is, um, first are the overriding mandatory provisions. Um, they are defined in Article 9 of the Rome 1 regulation, which, um, um, as we know by now, is not mandatorily um, or is not applicable in, in arbitrary proceedings. However, the definition provided here is generally accepted. So we can take from Article 9.1 um, of the Rome 1 regulation the definition that an overriding mandatory provision is one that is regarded as crucial by a country for safeguarding its public interests to an extent that um, it shall apply irrespective of the otherwise applicable law. Yeah? So if the concern or if the protection of a weak party is really that important, yeah, then it already applies by way of um, an overriding mandatory provision in arbitration. Um, Article 9, um, Rome 1 regulation is paragraphs 2 and 3. Um, contains some more detailed rules which in any event don't apply that strictly in arbitration. So we can skip that and move to Article 34, which concerns the second thing, which is the public policy test um, for arbitral awards. And any arbitral award is subject to a state court review um, for compliance with public policy of that state. Uh, and under the case law of the European Court of Justice, public policy of any European Union member state also includes um, European public policy. Uh, and part of that European public policy is inter alia consumer protection to a certain extent, or phrased differently, some rules of consumer protection. What is really important for consumer protection is part of European public policy. And therewith, an arbitral award that violates um, these basic rules um, will not stand review, state court review in setting aside or uh, recognition or enforcement proceedings. So that's, it's not only that um, Rome 1 wouldn't do the job for protecting the parties, but it's also that um, there is protection by other means. And one final inconsistency, and that's the last slide. Um, if that were different, yeah, then we had full flexibility in choice of law for purely national proceedings, since they are not governed by Rome 1 at all, since that relates only to cross-border proceedings. And we had very restricted choice of law for international proceedings. And that is an absurd result. Thank you. sit here and answer questions. Yeah. You didn't announce that. Well, thank you, Reimer, for that comprehensive discussion about the application of uh, European law in, or at least the Rome 1 regulation in arbitration. Um, we have now a quarter of an hour for questions to both speakers. Um, are there already any questions in the audience here? Or well, there are several. <laughs> Let's start with my co-director, Carsten Thorn. Yes, uh, thanks for your presentation, as uh, with regard to your presentation. I thought it was a so, thank you for your presentation. Actually, I'm totally in consistence with your point of view that, uh, as my colleague was very surprised, uh, that uh, arbitral tribunals are not bound by, by Rome 1. Uh, maybe for a reason you wouldn't like, because I think it's, it's not on equal standing, because actually, my basic argument would be a court is bound by law and statute, as it's written in our constitution, an arbitrable isn't. So you have a bigger uh, freedom. A court couldn't decide like uh, arbitral tribunals under Article 28, Paragraph 3, just without any, 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 any regard of law or statutes. Uh, and, and so it shows that the two procedures are different, and, and I would argue uh, that also shows that uh, uh, the uh, arbitration is not bound by, by Rome 1, 
and it's also a consequence of Ahmea. If uh, uh, the European Court of Justice has decided uh, that uh, uh, you cannot uh, start doing the proceedings before the European uh, Court of Justice, then it's a consequence that uh, you have not to apply it. Uh, a question, because I was not so convinced by some of your arguments with regard to weaker parties. The fact that two business parties can get rid of the uh, RGB controller, the uh, control of standard terms, can be explained because they are able to choose a law where you have not such a control. So if the parties can escape German law by just choosing another law, then they can also get rid of the control. They cannot do so just by saying, we do not want the arbitral, uh, arbitrators to, to apply it, if you do not refer to Article 28, Paragraph 3. Uh, if you are bound by Rome 1, if you would be bound by Rome 1, which is not my, my, my point of view, uh, then you would have the mandatory protection of consumers by, their, by the law of their habitual residence, which would also have as a consequence that you cannot derogate from those provisions under substantive law. I, I don't see that point. And then maybe the last point would be you have also another instrument to protect weaker parties, arbitrability as it's used in employment uh, contracts. Uh, maybe one short question to, to our colleague from Brazil. Uh, you uh, mentioned the Mercosur Convention on International Arbitration and, and you invited uh, for its broader use. Uh, I was a little bit puzzled by the very broad territorial scope of application of the convention, which was based simply on the seat of arbitration, but you can also apply it to other uh, cases where you have uh, arbitration abroad. Uh, I would see one problem. Of course, the arbitrators, uh, by virtue of party autonomy, and it's related to your argument, the arbitrators would be bound by such a, a choice of law done by the parties in favor of the Mercosur Convention. But the courts at the seat of arbitration wouldn't be. So if you refer to issues like capacity of the parties, there would be a risk that you have a split decision. The arbitrators would decide upon the capacity of the party, but a court which would be involved in preliminary, in preliminary proceedings or parallel proceedings or in the proceedings of setting aside would apply different conflict of law rules, namely the one at the seat of the court, at the next, the next forum. It was too long, I know. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I would indeed say that, so I'm with you that if the matter comes up before a state court, you could not do away by way of agreement with the, with the review of uh, standard terms and conditions in B2B contracts. In arbitration, however, that should work. So you, if you agree on German law being applicable with the exception of this B2B um, standard term control, then this shall be valid and shall be working. So there is no need to go to Switzerland with your place of arbitration. You can stay in Germany, just exclude the general terms and conditions but control. Swiss, but uh, have an uh, arbitration in Germany and just, just uh, choose Swiss law to be applicable. Yeah, that likewise works, um, but it works regardless of whether there exists any other law that doesn't um, have such broad terms and conditions control. So I believe, so, so you can, that, that's more a German perspective. So if, if you choose German law, yeah, and you, you and, and then the question is, is that essentially part of, of public policy, that you have a, an extended B2B um, pub, uh, um, control review? Yeah? And if you say, and that is, I believe, the, the, the correct and the, the prevailing view, there is, that is not par part of public policy, yeah? then you can, before an arbitral tribunal, do away with that part of German law, yeah, and you would not run into setting aside issues later on. Nadia, do you want to answer to the Latin American part, the Mercosur part? Yes, yes. Um, from what I understand, the problem is whether the tribunal uses the rules of the Mercosur agreement, and later on, if there is an issue in courts, the courts would be bound by another law. Well, it is quite wide, the scope 
of the Mercosur Agreement. That is true. It allows parties to choose the Mercosur Agreement. And even though they are not parties to that setting, it is sufficient that the arbitral tribunal has a seat in one of a Mercosur country, which means you have an international arbitration. Parties are from two different countries and only the fact that they choose the seat in a Mercosur country, they are able to agree that the Mercosur agreement will be binding to them. They will submit to the agreement. And well, that is really an open avenue. I haven't seen cases on that. As I said in the beginning, I don't think the Mercosur agreement is very used. But if it's challenging courts, I don't think the court will go to the merits of what the tribunal did. So I don't see either, even if there's a nullity on capacity, yes, you may go further, but in fact, they would not review the merits of the case and the case would already be decided. And I think the capacity is part of the case. So I don't see how, although the courts will have a different set of private international rules that would interfere with the use of the Mercosur agreement. Thank you. There was another question up here. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for two very interesting uh, interventions. I, I have a question, comment question on, uh, on uh, uh, on the question of applicability of Rome 1 to, to, to arbitration. Um, I do agree that the three arguments that you mentioned in favor of application are not convincing. So, so I would not have used those arguments. Uh, there is one argument that I think uh, I, that, that, that is more uh, likely to, to, to be referred to, not necessarily for saying that Rome 1 is binding, but uh, that Rome 1 could or should be taken into consideration by arbitral tribunals. And it is that it gives a basis for exercising the discretion of the arbitral tribunal in a predictable way. So predictability is very important to the parties. They need to know which law is going to be applied because they need to, to, to know what arguments they have to plead and, uh, and uh, whether it's worthwhile uh, uh, going to arbitration or whether they should settle out of court and so on. So predictability is important and uh, taking into consideration a system of private international law permits the arbitral tribunal to exercise its discretion in a way that is predictable to the parties. And in addition, it gives the arbitral tribunal a basis to try to avoid the risk of rendering an award that will be set aside or will refuse them, be refused enforcement on the basis of what you are mentioning, the public policy exception that, uh, that uh, otherwise would, uh, that the award otherwise would be exposed to if the arbitral tribunal was disregarding completely any question of uh, which law is applicable and are there any overriding mandatory rules or is there any public, uh, public policy issue. So, thank you. I agree. Okay. <laughs> You're giving in too fast. <laughs> that, that, yes. was, that was not a good... Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Just uh, a very short comment uh, that might be a question, really. It's a little bit concerning when we begin to elevate arbitration to the same level as national courts. I think we might need to, to, to rethink that a little bit. And I don't think that that makes arbitration a second tier level of dispute resolution, but it's not, they're not national courts. Um, and then the second point goes to what the lovely lady sitting in front uh, just said, which is this whole idea of the need for predictability, which goes again to transactional costs for the parties. And then I was just wondering if the Rome 1 makes that distinction between procedure and substance, B because Rome 1 
applies to sub, sub, the, the substantive part of it. And uh, the elimination or exclusion of Brussels 1 uh, as it relates to courts and arbitration being questions of procedure uh, and whether that has any impact on, on the analysis that you made. Does, does, does the question sound, is it reasonably clear? You're looking puzzled. Um, <laughs> It is, it is currently a bit tricky to, to, to meet all the expectations. Some, sometimes I speak too long, then I think the answers are too short. Then I, um, I frankly don't understand the third question. The second one, I can, can certainly spend a word on that. This is indeed true, especially if you are the one who has to determine the applicable law under Article 28, second paragraph of the model law, and it just says, choose the one you, that you deem fit, yeah? then it's, it's always better um, uh, to, to look into, well, an, an inapplicable law to, to see uh, what that would provide um, um, in case it had been applicable, um, instead of just, well, rolling the dice. Uh, certainly, yeah, so that's, that's certainly a good idea to, to, to seek guidance or persuasive authority from Rome 1. Um, the first, your first question had, ah, equal, equal standing, right. Um, so that is at least what um, the, what the uh, 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 German legislator had positively put forward to say um, arbitral tribunals are different from state courts, yeah, but they are on the, operating on the same level and they provide the same level of legal protection as a state court does. So at least from, from that perspective, there is no, yeah, it's, it's different, it's not the same, certainly, yeah, but it's not second class. And the third question, you would need to, to rephrase that if I shall answer it. Well, it was just on procedure. Hmm? The difference between procedure and substance. Yeah, so. so it's the yeah. Content. Oh, sorry. Just the internal content, what Rome 1 provides for, and the guidance is substantive. And while arbitration, uh, litigation, if you like, the, those are questions of procedure, which yeah, yeah, certainly. not govern. But, yeah. but the, the thing is that Rome 1, this, this recital number so and so, ties um, the, the substantive questions, namely Rome 1, to the procedural questions, namely Brussels 1. Yeah, my question goes to Rio de Janeiro. Uh, Nadia, when speaking about the um, party autonomy, and uh, you mentioned the arbitration, Brazilian arbitration law, which expressly provides for freedom of choice of, 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 of law, uh, the law applicable. Um, and uh, you, you see, uh, if, if an agreement is, if, is in place, arbitration agreement is in place, um, and you said if there's no arbitration agreement in place, then the lay, uh, lay the introduction, so the introductory law uh, comes into place, uh, and uh, this is restrictive. But you mentioned also that there is recent um, uh, jurisprudence from the Supreme Court uh, allowing or uh, having another look on, on, on the freedom of choice, the choice of uh, the applicable law. Um, is that a general or is it limited to specific contract or is it a general new approach which I'm not aware of? Well, our, uh, in Brazil there's a very clear separation that if you choose a law in a contract that has an arbitral agreement, to arbitrate, there's no problem with choice of law. There's freedom, there's party autonomy. If, there's, if you do not have a clause saying that you litigate in arbitration and you go to the judicial courts, our law of introduction, Article 9, does not provide for freedom of choice. Not in the way you see in Rome 1, in the Inter-American Convention, that you start the article with the freedom to choose, and then you have a regulation for when there was no choice. However, in later years, we had developments in the case law, and the Superior Court of Justice has, with Ministro Salomon's decision, said that you can choose and that the choice was valid. And it's mostly for B2B contracts business to business. And it was in a contest, the case was in a contest of um, money um, 
uh, a contract where somebody had money from a bank or something like that. So it was a very clear B2B contract. I have seen some contract, some cases where the party, although not weak parties, pretend to be weak parties because they say this type of contracts are adhesion contracts, contracts that are ready made from one party and the other just have to sign. And the court has made a distinction. Uh, not all weak party contracts, weak party contracts are different. Um, you cannot choose, but they're what we call adhesion contracts. Usually weak party contracts are adhesion contracts. Our contracts ready made, the parties just sign. But there are some contracts in businesses that one of the parties have a complete contract and the other only sign. And that's where the discussion is. So far, the court goes into the concrete the facts and, and analyzes to what extent the party involved can be considered weak or non-weak. And just the fact that the contract was made before and there was no change in the clauses do not allow them to invalidate choice. So we are heading towards freedom of choice, yes, to case law. And there's currently legislation in the legislative to change Article 9 and to embrace party autonomy. And also Brazil signatory to the CISG and also in contracts of CISG uh, buying and selling merchandise already have, we already have freedom of choice. And I think the big lesson of all we have said here today is that I would say to parties, do not leave that to the arbitrators. Please include a choice of law in your contracts because many times there's no such choice. I don't know why, but there's none. And parties have to be aware of the consequences and how difficult it is to decide such issues. And we have different avenues to decide such issues that the parties would have predictability, predictability if they have chosen beforehand. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, in principle, it would be coffee break already, but I see there's a number of questions. At least I want to give our foreign audience the, the opportunity to something. Ismail, from, we won't have the Egyptian perspective as well. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, so my question is, uh, from my understanding, uh, if the applicable ad hoc provisions provide for the liberty of the arbitral tribunal to apply whatever conflict of law rules it wishes to apply, uh, inspired by Article 28 of the model law, then the arbitral tribunal will have the freedom to apply the conflict of law rules uh, embodied in Rome 1. Is my understanding correct? Because the Rome 1 doesn't uh, contain an, an explicit uh, provision excluding uh, only arbitration agreement. The law applicable to the arbitration agreement is the only exclusion, but not the law applicable uh, to the merits of a contract uh, uh, where uh, the dispute of which is arbitrated. Am, am I correct? Yes. If we come to the loi de police or the mandatory rules, so Article 9, 1 and 9, 2, my understanding that Rome uh, 1, so Article 9, 2, limits uh, the implementation of the loi de police to the situation where if we apply the loi de police, the contract will be annulled. Am I correct? 9, no. 2. <laughs> no. No? No. Limits it to the settings in which um, it is so. Is the, the so? So we have we have waivable law, we have mandatory law, and we have these international uh, mandatory principles. And those international mandatory principles in Article Nine, Rome One, are those um, who concern important interests uh, that are so important that these rules shall apply regardless of whether they are applicable otherwise or not. Um, whether they lead to um, um, 
to, to um, avoid contract or to any other legal consequence, I believe that is subject to the specific provision that is to be taken into account. So they could also lead to, to, to other results. So there is case law of the European Court of Justice in which a commercial agent um, um, had been uh, subjected by choice of law to California law. Yeah? And um, that uh, deprived him uh, of a compensation claim that he had. And the result of this overriding mandatory principle um, under European law was that he was given yeah, that compensation claim. So this was, it was not nullity as a consequence, but this compensation claim in that, in that case. Thank you. In a proper cross-examination, you only answer with yes or no. Huh? <laughs> So thank you very much for your uh, questions. Thank you very much to both speakers for that excellent presentation. And we now have a coffee break in the Süd Lounge. Uh, if you leave the room here, turn to your right. And those of you who haven't registered, please register downstairs and also show your vaccination, whatever uh, admissions, uh, because we need that for public purposes. And then we meet each other again at 4 o'clock here. Uh, four o'clock German time, that means sharp. Okay, see you then in the break. Francisco, thank you for being here, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Stefan. It's really a pleasure to be here. I'm really happy to be here at Buserios. I'd like to thank you for the invitation and for this wonderful event. I'm here in front of my president, Capo di Tutti Capi, Mrs. Eleonora. Yeah, she is the Capo of, of insolvency in Brazil. And um, I'm really pleased to be here. And, and it's, it's a very important uh, occasion for us because as Eleonora is, is, part, uh, is part of the reason why arbitration in Brazil is becoming more and more important. Many cases, I would say probably the most important cases related to uh, large companies or large businesses are decided by uh, uh, arbitral tribunal and uh, uh, CCBC is certainly one of the main agents to provide that and Eleonora as well as president of the CCBC, is responsible. And, well, uh, I'm very glad to be here, and I'd like to address uh, some points related to uh, arbitrators' contract and uh, eventual conflicts related to arbitrators' con contract. Well, <coughs> first of all, um, the relation between parties and uh, the arbitrators is uh, a, a uh, controvert aspect of arbitration law. Uh, there are who says that um, uh, there is a, a judicial um, matter, a judicial aspect behind it, because we're talking about uh, the monopoly of, of the state to solve situations and, and actually what technically happens is the state delegates this function, this role, to one person that is appointed by the parties involved. Uh, but, um, and, and that was very clear in 96 when ICC Commission uh, released a work that uh, a report that's been made with many uh, professionals in this area and they were asked about what do you think that is uh, the relationship what's the nature of the relationship between the parties and the arbitrators and most of them said that arbitra arbitrators are bound by a contract. In every case, the arbitrator and the parties are bound by a specific contract. The subject matter of this heptum arbitri, uh, sometimes referred to as contract of investiture, uh, 
is the arbitrator performance of a very small a special task to settle the dispute between his fellows, fellow contracting parties. So, um, as uh, this 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 uh, way to see the investiture of the arbitrator as a contract uh, is very important uh, nowadays, and um, of course we cannot mistake this contract with the arbitration agreement that's been executed by the parties. We are talking about um, the contract that bind the arbitrator and the parties in order to provide a solution uh, for the case. Uh, like in almost every case in, 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 in law, of course, there is a, a third way to analyze it, and that is usually, and this is the case, a way to try to harmonize two different uh, um, uh, ways to see the, the matter. And in this case, of course, um, there are people that uh, define that this relationship between arbitrators and parties uh, are, of course, part of a contract they are based on a contract, but this contract is part of um, uh, an, a statutory definition that allows um, parties to choose someone to solve their own case, to find a solution to their own case. Uh, uh, the main issue here, and I, I, I actually would like to address, is well, even we consider that there is a contract, and even even if we consider that maybe uh, there are three different contracts, uh, one for each arbitrator, one for each co-arbitrator, and one for the president of the panel, and that makes absolutely no difference. Um, uh, those people. Uh, will uh, play the role of who is going to solve the problem. So arbitrators like judge will decide the matter for the parties that disagree about it. So uh, it has a, a judicial impact, definitely it has a judicial impact. To, to uh, carry on those those uh, tasks, the arbitrator has to be independent and impartial. Independency and impartiality are legal requirements for arbitrator in most of legal systems. And even if they don't follow the anti trial model law on arbitration, what's the case of Brazil? Brazilian Brazil has its own on law and arbitration, and it works, but has minor differences if compared to uh, uncitral model law. Uh, when considering uh, uncitral model law, Article 12 says that when a person is approached in connection with his possible appointment as an arbitrator, he shall disclose any circumstances likely to give rise to justifiable doubts as to his impartiality or independence. Um, I will address the question of the disclosure later, but um, at the first moment I'd like to, to um, address here the difference between independence and impartiality. Uh, Independence, independence is much more objectively measured by the absence of social ties between arbitrator and parties or one of the parties. Uh, and this sort of, of, of link would bind, would, would um, poison the way that arbitrator would uh, act. Uh, 
uh, uh, impartiality by another uh, side is uh, subjective, uh, is a state of mind, is understood as a, an, uh, the arbitrator's bias in favor or harm to one of the parties. Uh, of course, here we're talking about a more broad uh, uh, group of aspects that, that may uh, influence. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, that made my speech much better. And <laughs> definitely. <laughs> yeah, we can go on later. <laughs> and. and uh, well, uh, the point is, um, of course, we are not seeking for neutrality. Uh, neutrality is perhaps too much to be aimed for. When parties choose an arbitrator, they choose an arbitrator that, in general, knows the subject, is close to the subject, is a specialist in that subject and that is desirable. And when someone is too close to one specific subject, obviously this person will have any kind of um, personal opinion or um, tendency and etc. And this is not a problem unless uh, this pointed arbitrator had already decided or declared one opinion that would be against one, uh, the interest of one of the parties. Uh, what's important is, and, and this is something that we've noticed a lot in Brazil, uh, as arbitration grows, as the, uh, the importance of arbitration, arbitration grows in Brazil, uh, the judiciary, the answer of the judiciary is, of course, not um, intervene in the content of the, the decisions, in the content of, of the sentences, the arbitral sentences, but uh, to scrutinize, to double, double check if those decisions are not harmed, are not poisoned by any sort of uh, a problem and, and um, the conflict of interest is probably one of the most important problems that, that we have been uh, facing in Brazil. To avoid that, uh, the arbitrator must disclose, disc uh, disclose any uh, aspect that uh, he considered to be important for the parties to decide on accepting him or her as an arbitrator or not. So, um, as a, a contractual tool, as a, uh, a non-judicial tool, and as a tool that uses um, common people as, as uh, ways to find a solution, those who are appointed as arbitrators must uh, disclose uh, whatever they think that is important for the parties to decide if they are or not uh, impartial and uh, independent. The lack, the lack of, of, of of disclosure is not by itself uh, a reason to um, to fight the decision. So even if one specific aspect is not disclosed by uh, the arbitrator, uh, this should not be the case for a, a judiciary to uh, um, de declare null and void what's been done by the tribunal. 
Um, however, we have cases in Brazil, at least one case in Brazil, where the Superior Court understood that uh, when the arbitrator failed to disclose relevant information related to, and, and, and I'll briefly talk about that, um, relevant information related to uh, his, uh, the relationship of his law firm with one of the parties. Um, no matter if that eff effect effectively affected uh, the decision, that was a kind of problem that would poison f to death the decision and so the tribunal, the tribunal, the court decided that that would be null and void. Uh, I would have a, a, a lot to say, but uh, uh, I'd like to just to bring bring up some uh, important issues. Uh, I would say new, not new issues, but recent issues that that have made um, disclosure more important and that have made the decision about an impartiality and independence uh, more difficult, tougher. And the two points are, the first one is, uh, as I just mentioned here, uh, the relationship, I would say three points. The first one is the relationship uh, between the law firm to which the arbitrator belong, and that's something that usually happens in Brazil. It's not unusual that the arbitrator is part of a law firm, a huge law firm, and those law firms have different sectors, and those different sectors provide services for many, many business agents. So it's not unusual that before an arbitration or after an arbitration, or during an arbitration, um, uh, the law firm gets some kind of, of uh, money from one of the parties and this would be a reason for um, uh, put into uh, uh, doubt uh, the independence and impartiality of the arbitrator. Uh, the second point that is a reality right now is third-party funding. Third-party funding is reality. It's reality in, in arbitration and it's reality in other uh, matters, like, for example, what we are going to talk about here next um, Thursday, and um, insolvency. So it's quite, it's, it's quite usual to have a, a fund an investment fund funding um, uh, arbitrations or funding, for example, uh, asset tracing procedures. And that makes it very complex to define if an arbitrator is or not independent and impartial. Because uh, not always this funding is disclosed and whenever this funding is disclosed, uh, those agents, th those fundings, those funds, they actually work, their main activity is to fund arbitration, is to fund procedure. Therefore, uh, it's not difficult to find same funds, f funds or same hedge funds or whatever, funding uh, lots of different procedures and uh, that brings some complexity to how to analyze, how to verify uh, impartiality and independence of the um, arbitrator. Uh, but the last point that I just would like to mention with you right now, I'd just like to bring on just for you to think about, is um, what we call collective arbitration or class action arbitration, arbitration with multiple parties, many parties. In 
in this case, it, it becomes really, really complex to certify that an arbitrator is not uh, in any way linked directly or indirectly to any of the possible beneficiaries of one specific decision. And why do I bring this here today? Uh, we have in Brazil, and I think that this is, is, a, is not a, just a Brazilian tendency. We have in Brazil uh, a mandatory uh, arbitration for uh, companies, for public health companies that are listed in one specific sector of our stock exchange. So if they want to be part of the sector of stock exchange, there is a special segment of stock exchange. Uh, they have to comply with some uh, uh, aspects. And one of the aspects is they, have, they must have a, a, an arbitration agreement, an arbitration clause, and all the questions arising from the relationship between um, um, stakeholders, shareholders, management, and uh, controllers or whatever, all these issues shall be solved by arbitration and the uh, stock exchange chamber shall be used for that. Um, this is really uh, interesting and has worked well. That brings another issue that is um, uh, confidentiality as this is part of the regulation in in capital market, in securities market, confidentiality sometimes um, satisfies the parties, but uh, does not comply with what would be expected as a example for regulation. But this is, is not the point. The point is, um, in many cases, and I've heard the previous speech that was really, really good, um, the, uh, the, the, the procedure will involve shareholders, and sometimes they are small shareholders, weak parties, and sometimes there, are, there will be many weak parties, or, and, and they are mixed with uh, some huge players, and the point is, uh, it's quite difficult to um, uh, find an arbitrator that will have no link at all with any of the possible beneficiaries of a decision. And I would go further. Um, we had a case where uh, the father of one of the one person that was appointed as an as an arbitration as an arbitrator, the father had for years, for many years, uh, stocks, a nice amount of stocks of one specific company that would be part in an arbitration, and the, the appointed arbitrator that had nothing to do with the company had never ever uh, bought any stock. Um, he could not become the arbitrator because they thought that they that he had he was biased by uh, the fact that the company if the company succeeded so his father would get a good amount of money. Uh, what I, I want to bring here is um, well, we are go going further, two or three steps further uh, from what we had before. And I would say that collective arbitration or uh, multiple parties arbitration is a tendency, not just in Brazil, but it's a tendency. And maybe the tools that we have to define independence and impartiality of the arbitrators will uh, not be adequate to solve these sort of problems. So, and, and I will finish with this here.
the main point I would like to address with you is uh, maybe we are facing something, we are facing a, a, a phase where we shall find new tools to define when an arbitrator is um, independent and impartial. And I think that this will come very, very, very soon. Thank you very much. And now we can have music. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. So thank you very much for your presentation. And um, we decided also that we have the question session on this one directly. And let me take the prerogative of the one moderating that. Um, I have a question. You mentioned a very interesting case where the Brazilian courts apparently declared an award uh, or annulled an award uh, due to the or lack of impartiality of an arbitrator. Was there a follow-up? case on that, that someone brought an action against the arbitrator, or was that just it finished and then the award was set aside and nothing else came out of that? Um, the, 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 the procedure finished and then the losing part decided that, well, uh, that information should be disclosed before. And the tribunal said, yes, of course, that, that information should be disclosed before, so we'll consider the decision null and void. Uh, but it was after the end of the procedure. It's just like the part keeping a joker and the leaves and waiting until the last minute to decide because if he won the case, he probably would not take it that into consideration. Yeah. You want to say something, Eleanor? Yeah. Can we have a microphone? Thank you, Francisco, for your presentation. Now in Brazil, we are uh, at a stage in which we are thinking and the judiciary is, is defining the standards of uh, the duty of um, disclosure of the arbitrator. So uh, we are thinking if the mere fact that the arbitrator has not disclosed a fact, is it enough for a award to be declared null and void or not. I know that in most countries it's not enough. There should be other elements during the procedure such as the conduct of the arbitrator or you know, any misconduct, I would say. But it's true that in Brazil we have had like one case and there are another case going on now that they are deciding that if the mere fact of not having disclosed is enough. I'd like to know in Germany, for instance, what are the standards of the judiciary in terms of declaring our award null and void whenever an arbitrator does not disclose a fact? Does it have to be a very important fact? Uh, do they take into consideration the conduct of an arbitrator during the arbitral proceedings? I know you're not the speaker, but... <laughs> No, from, from the German perspective, you probably asked the wrong person uh, because I'm involved in one of the cases where they have set aside the award because one of the arbitrators has not disclosed uh, connections and um, which was also a case which dealt, led to a number of decisions concerning conflict of law questions. Yeah, where do you bring the actions against the arbitrator? And uh, but that if, was... But, but if a, another person would be sitting here, right here where I am, yeah, this other person would say. <laughs> <laughs> this other person, Just joking. <laughs> no, this other person would say, um, <laughs> it's a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> no, in the, the standard imposed by some of the uh, German courts is incredible. Yeah, um, we had a um, case where they alleged that disclosure um, there was a disclosure obligation upon one of the um, very well-known female arbitrators in Germany. Uh, she had been working with someone in a law firm um, 12 years ago, and the court considered that there was a disclosure, but in the end came to the conclusion, okay, that's not sufficient to set aside the award because um, that, that's so long and it hadn't any effect on the award. Um, it's a little bit erratic here as well. Yeah? So some of the courts have just adopted standards which are yeah, out of this world, yeah? where you say that's more to kill arbitration. As Francisco rightly said, you select an arbitrator because he knows something about the topic, and that always means 
there may be some relation somewhere. And 12 years ago, having worked in the same law firm, you as an associate and the other one as a partner, excuse me, that's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah but, but, but judiciary, in Brazil, oh, sorry. judiciary in Brazil has been very fair with arbitration. Uh, this is one case, and, and it's the first one, so we cannot complain about judiciary in Brazil, but that's, that's a very important issue. Yeah. I should do more cases in Brazil. Yeah. <laughs> On this uh, very question, uh, there are, uh, as you said, many different standards. I'm doing, actually, a, a, the general report for the uh, Congress of the International Academy of uh, Comparative Law on Internet, uh, independence and impartiality, and I'm, I have in my bag now all the reports, and I can say that uh, uh, there is no uniform uh, approach to this. Uh, the majority of the countries uh, seems to not have an automatic effect uh, that uh, if you have not disclosed something, then you are automatically disqualified. But for example, in Italy, there is right now in these days a, a reform project according to which if you are not disclosed something that you were under a duty to disclose, then you are automatically disqualified. And the interesting things is, the thing is that um, the duty to disclose is, has actually a lower threshold than uh, the disqualification. So you may end up being disqualified for not having disclosed something that would not have disqualified you if you had disclosed it. And uh, the... Uh, another aspect is that uh, arbitral institutions, they tend to be quite severe when it turns out that an arbitrator has not disclosed something. Uh, I'm sitting in a couple of uh, boards of, uh, not in Germany, but, uh, but in Italy, in Norway, and in the court of the ICC as well. And uh, we tend to be a little bit annoyed if an arbitrator has not disclosed something, which does not mean that there is an automatic effect, but uh, still. It's a breach of a duty, because there is a duty of disclosure in any case. Yeah. There was a qu qu question over there, in the back. Emilia? Open it. I can speak to the uh, English position, which is that there has to be materiality. It's, it's linked back to, to how material the non-disclosure is and all you need to, if you want to know how much we've moved in that direction, just just read Halliburton v. Chop, which was a ridiculous decision. I hope this is not being recorded, but anyway, it was a ridiculous <laughs> decision. Uh, but it's important uh, because that shows the attitude of the English courts, and that's because of um, we the the, um, the irregularity point for, for setting aside an award in the English Arbitration Act, section 69, I think, or 67, whichever one of them, uh, and that is important. So that links that, that list links that back. But if you have a jurisdiction that is engaging with this discussion, I think the fallback position should be the IBA conflicts guidelines. Uh, and so that we begin to force national courts to actually listen to, to practitioners and what uh, our expectations are. The English courts have said clearly that they're not bound by the IBA guidelines, uh, conflict of interest, because of course it's the English courts. I mean, <laughs> we're not bound by anything except what we decide we want to do, uh, and because we have the common law. But, but, but I think it's important that we begin to you know, get courts to move in that direction because it goes back to the point we made earlier on. This whole idea of predictability, we want to know, is it three years or is it two years so we know what, what it is uh, we're doing. If you ask for my personal opinion, if you do not disclose, then that should, you should be disqualified just for not disclosing. Because we need to force arbitrators as well to be able to think through a little bit more carefully. But at the, the other side of the coin is how much is enough? You have arbitrators who disclose too much uh, and lots of irrelevances, and then you have those who under-disclose. I don't know if that helps. Thanks, Emilia. There's a question up here, or comment. Just a question. Is it of any importance how long the uh, party applying for setting aside knows about the fact who was not disclosed by the other party? 
uh, or is it uh, a, a, a second remark? I guess the fact that your father earns something from your decision should somehow disqualify you as an arbitrator also in future, I guess. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> that's true. But the, the main point is sometimes uh, if you don't disclose, disclose something that would not disqualify you as, an, uh, as you as an arbitrator, that's exactly the point that you, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, you said. Uh, um, this is a, v well, of course, the, uh, the, the arbitrator should disclose everything. But what's everything? Uh, should the arbitrator disclose that his father had uh, stocks on that specific company. I don't even know if he knows. Um, should he know that? Should, should, if I will be an arbitrator in a stock markets case, should I send an email to all my my parents, my my, my relatives, and say, "Well, any of you have stocks in that specific company? Um, which are the limits?" for that case. That's the main point, I think. Uh, and, uh, because if, if just by not disclosing, you, you will uh, allow this disqualifying of the uh, arbitration award, uh, maybe that would be a joke in your leave. Um, so it's better if everything is quite clear, isn't it? Thank you. Any further question? Any questions? Sorry? Oh, sorry. Yes. I'm sorry? Does it, it have any impact how long you know the fact? In principle, can you wait and see what the outcome is and then say well, check? I think that that should be, but it's quite difficult to prove how, how long have you been knowing that that would be a fact. And that's the point. Um, what I usually do when, I'm, when, I'm, when I am an arbitrator, at that uh, certain point, I say, well, this is one specific point, so parties shall... Um, uh, talk about this. If you have nothing to, to complain about that, let's go on. So that would be a way to solve, practically solve the situation. But um, um, uh, it, it's, quite, it's quite difficult to, to know that. Um, um, I, I could bring you some examples um, that are situations uh, where there uh, in, in a regular basis, of course, an arbitrator should disclose the situation, but sometimes it's, it's something that is uh, so uh, indirect that you have to uh, consider that. I, I will give you an example. Um, um, two arbitrators that used to work together, they had no company, they had no law firm, but they, they are well known by working together. And then, um, well, all, both of them had the, their own assistants. Well, one of the assistants of one of them was son of the party uh, in uh, an arbitration that the other one was arbitrator. And that came in the middle of the procedure. And the party decided, I don't trust you anymore. But the guy, the arbitrator, just didn't know that. Um, what, well, was he supposed to know that his uh, close friend uh, had an employee or something? Th those are uh, difficult issues, I think. Um, I don't want to solve this specific case here right now, but uh, I, I'm, what I, I want to, to bring to you and what, what, what I want to share with you is, are we able to um, previously define every situation under which would be necessary to disclose? Because if you are not able to do that, how can we consider the lack of disclosure uh, itself a reason for uh, disqualification of the arbitration war? And, and that's the main point. There was one final question over there. Huh? Otherwise, you take away your own time, Judith. Uh, so you you list this um, three instances of uh, of uh, where you think it will be a serious conflict in terms of an arbitrator, and there's one that 
I, it's not the first time I hear it, but I've always found it worrying and not, and not a very solid uh, background on it, and this is the third party funding, right? And for me, this third party funding, whether there's disclosure or none, most of the time doesn't seem to be a problem because in essence, then I think third party funding is more complicated than a relationship of whereby a third party funder just funds many cases. So is the problem like, for example, he funded a case that the arbitrator was working on? Because that then would not be any different from the arbitrator worked on a case for the claimant before and that's not a, a sufficient reason, even if he's appointed? Or is it the benefit that he is, the third party funder is funding a case at the moment, then the arbitrator will just be getting their legal fees, which is what is due to them. And this is not something that there is a disclosure. So what is this specific interest in funding that an arbitrator is required to, to disclose? And, and I, f I don't find it any at least I don't see any basis on most of these factual instances. Well, at, at this point, it, it would be important that the, the f uh, funding agent would disclose, disclose that he was funding, that he is the funding member of that arbitration. Uh, the point is, when you talk about impartiality and independence, it's always independence related to someone independence related to the parties, related to the attorneys of the parties, the council of the parties. And well, as uh, third party funding becomes something, something that is part, that is common in arbitrations, I think that it's, uh, it's fair enough to consider that you should uh, test, you, you, you should double check the relation between arbitration, the, arbit the, arb the arbitrator, and the third party funding, the third part that is funding the arbitration. Uh, there is, um, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm think it's an, it's an English case where the, the, the agent that was a third, pi a third part funder, uh, he was funding one case uh, that was being uh, carried on by the law firm uh, of the arbitrator. So actually the arbitrator had no direct um, relationship with the third, third party that was funding the, the, the procedure, but the law firm had it. And um, my question is, and I'm not affirming anything here, uh, is this something important to affect the impartiality and independence of the arbitrator. Uh, what I think is, well, for example, if there are different attorneys, different law firms, uh, but and these different law firms appoint the same person as an arbitration, and this is a real case, but in all the cases that, that these different law firms appoint this specific arbitrators, all these cases are funded by the same third part, the third party. Is this something that should be disclosed? Um, I think this, if I was part in this case, I would like to know that and I would like to uh, evaluate it. Um, so I think this is something to take into account. I'm not saying that you are not you should, should uh, make it illegal or, or uh, not allow someone to do that. No, that's not the point. But just how should you deal with this uh, new center of interest that is uh, related to the arbitration procedure? And that's not specifically the parties. So I think you should have a different treatment. But, but I absolutely uh, understand your point, definitely. Thank you very much. There were probably a number of further questions, but if we want to leave some time for Judita yeah, on, that, uh, on mandatory rules, uh, we have to stop here. Thank you very much, Francisco, uh, for being here, for taking the time. Once again, thank yeah. you very much for the invitation and the pleasure to be here. Okay. Thank you. Thanks.
Okay, now we switch over to the uh, other announced issue, which deals with uh, mandatory rules in arbitration, disregard or ex officio application. And it's a great pleasure to announce Professor Judito Cordero Moss from the Uni, Judita Cordero Moss from the University of Oslo. And as I had already said at the beginning, she started off as a practicing lawyer for a well-known Italian firm, then a Norwegian firm, and then became an academic. And since then is uh, researching in the field of comparative law. And those of my students who have participated in the drafting class will know her works from many excerpts in my class. Judith, it's a great pleasure for me to have you here, and we're looking forward to your presentation. I've read already something on that, and I'm looking forward for the discussion later on. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation, and thank you so much for, for the day so far. It has been incredibly interesting, so, so I hope that uh, we will be able to maintain a certain uh, level. Uh, let me see. This is the, the big one is the one that I have to press. Yeah. So I have one picture and a half and probably I repeat this picture twice. But, uh, but, um, but mostly it's, uh, uh, it's words also in my presentation. This is Arlecchino here. Arlecchino is an Italian folk uh, figure uh, that uh, is known for, among other things, uh, having been the object of uh, a comedy by Carlo Goldoni in the 18th century. Um, he was the servant of two masters, and uh, of course uh, he knew how to take advantage of that. Uh, that is an analogy with arbitration. Arbitration is also the servant of two masters. On the one hand is party autonomy, on the other hand is uh, court control. So this is the double nature of arbitration of which we have heard a little bit earlier. Is it a contractual nature? Is it a judicial nature? And it is a little bit of both. Party autonomy is the basis of arbitration. Everyone is uh, saying that arbitration is uh, the realm of party autonomy, and it is, absolutely. There would be no arbitration if it, was, it had not been chosen by the parties. So the arbitration agreement and the pleadings of the parties, they set the scene for arbitration, they give the arbitral tribunal the power, they decide the scope of jurisdiction, they decide the law that has to be applied, and so on. On the other hand, we have court control. We have heard earlier today that uh, uh, if an arbitral award is against public policy, then it can be set aside or it can be refused enforcement. If an arbitral award, uh, an arbitral tribunal exceeds its power in rendering the award because it has not uh, respected uh, the agreement between the parties, then also the award can be set aside and refused enforcement. So these are the two masters between which arbitration has to find a balance, hopefully a better balance than the one that uh, Arlecchino finds in, uh, in Carlo Goldoni's comedy. But in any case, this is the scene. And then my question is, what happens if we have to assume that party autonomy is sovereign and uh, arbitration is the realm of party autonomy? But what happens if a party during the proceedings invokes a law different from the law that has been chosen in the agreement. And I will jump to the example and then I will jump back. Typical example, technology license contract with market sharing and price fixing and so on. This is the typical thing that is against competition law, typical uh, situation where the contract is actually null and void because it is against competition law. I could have chosen another more modern uh, example, like a contract that is against sanctions, for example, which is a very hot topic right now. Or it could be a contract, uh, well, I have a contract on corruption afterwards, so that I have already. <laughs> but okay, let's stick to competition because there is some case law, so it is easier to, to make the point. So if you have a technology license contract with market sharing that is against competition law, 
and therefore EU competition law in our example, and therefore it is actually null and void under the law that should govern it. The contract contains the choice of law of the law of Ruritania, and uh, under the law of Ruritania, the contract is not invalid. So one party does not perform, the other party starts an arbitration, wants to get reimbursement of damages because there has been a breach of contract, and the first party says, I am not responsible, uh, liable for breach of contract because uh, there was no contract, because the contract was invalid under competition law. So the party invokes EU competition law as a defense in spite of the fact that the contract has chosen the law of the Ruritania. And the claimant claims that the law of Ruritania is the only law applicable because that's the only law that the party ha parties have chosen. This is the first scenario of my what if. And then if this works also backwards, yes it does. The second scenario is what if the contract is affected by the applicable law in a way that was not pleaded by the parties. The difference with the first example is that now it's not one party that invokes the law that was not chosen, but it is the arbitral tribunal uh, that does it. This is the example consultancy contract that conceals bribes to officials. So it is actually a corruption contract or a contract uh, uh, based on corruption or for the purpose of making corruption. A, one party, uh, no, sorry, a difference. A difference arises between the parties, but both parties, they are interested in maintaining the contract. So none of the parties wants to invoke the law on corruption saying that uh, this, is, uh, this is an invalid contract. So they are maybe even instructing the, uh, the, the arbitral tribunal not to consider uh, the rule on corruption, or they are simply being quiet on the issue of corruption and just pleading the question of whether the contract was uh, properly, uh, properly uh, performed or not. So these are the two examples, and my questions are, what does the arbitral tribunal do in these situations? This is a very obvious dilemma for the arbitral tribunal. Does the arbitral tribunal decide to apply the law that has been chosen by the parties, the law of the Ruritania in the first case, or to disregard, uh, to, to follow the instructions by the parties and disregard the issue of corruption in the second example? Does the tribunal have to do that because party autonomy is sovereign? In that case, the award runs the risk of being set aside or refused enforcement. Or does the arbitral tribunal consider EU competition law or the issue of corruption? In the first case, in the first example, on the request of one party, but against the agreement in the contract. In the second case, ex officio. If the tribunal does so, he will, it will render an award that is not necessarily set aside and not refused enforcement for public policy reasons, but it may be set aside or refused enforcement for excess of power. So does the arbitral tribunal has to choose between which reasons for setting aside and refusing enforcement he has to prefer, or how does this work? And this is the balancing. This is the second time we see the picture. Uh, this is the balancing between uh, excess of power on one side, which would be a reason for setting aside or refusing enforcement if party autonomy was in a completely unlimited way sovereign. Excess of power on one side, contrast with public policy on the other side. You know the Eco-Swiss decision by the European Court of Justice who said that a contract or an award that uh, infringes EU competition law is an award that infringes uh, public policy. And uh, you have a long list there of uh, Cour d'Appel de Paris decisions, the, the Paris Court of Appeal, who, you know that the Paris Court of Appeal is notorious for being very favorable to arbitration. And uh, in, recently, you see that they are both 2020 and 2021. Uh, in these recent decisions, the Court of, uh, of Appeal of Paris decided to set aside awards or refuse enforcement uh, in spite of the fact that the arbitral tribunal had decided otherwise 
for violation of public policy, and it were all cases that involved corruption. So the Court, uh, Court of Appeal of Paris uh, is starting to take a more uh, a stricter uh, approach when it comes to corruption, economic uh, crime, and so on. So, what is then the solution that I suggest very quickly because we do not have so much time, and I ha as you can see, I have a long uh, list of material, but, uh, but I, I will uh, uh, limit myself. So, the Question, let's uh, go back. To find out whether the arbitral tribunal exceeds its power when it acts in a way that prevents from rendering an award against public policy. So to find out whether the tribunal can disregard what the parties have chosen in terms of law or what the parties have pleaded without exceeding its power so that the award does not run the risk of being set aside for either of these two masters of the arbitration. To find that out, I think that public, uh, private international law is very useful. It is private international law that gives you actually the basis for serving both masters without uh, uh, offending uh, any of them. Party autonomy, what the parties have chosen, the law of Ruritania, is something that applies to the merits of the dispute. And the point is the dispute. The merits of the dispute is not all issues that arise within the dispute. It's the direct object of the dispute. It's the issue on which the arbitral tribunal is capable of rendering an award that will have res judicata effect between the two parties. Any incidental issues, like for example, whether the contract was valid or not because it is infringing rules on corruption or rules on competition. The rules on corruption and the rules of competition, whether they have been complied with or not, this is not the direct object of the dispute. This is the object of an incidental question, a preliminary question. This is not going to be subject to the res judicata. This is only a incidental step, a fact. It's like a fact that uh, the uh, arbitral tribunal is taking into consideration as a step in the reasoning towards whether the contract has been breached or not. And the dispute only regards whether the contract has been breached or not. So when the parties have chosen the law of the Ruritania, they have chosen it for the object of the dispute, for the main claim, whether the contract was breached or not. The incidental questions, whether competition law, whether the contract was valid because competition law has been uh, infringed, corruption, taxes, export, import, and so on. Those are incidental questions, and party autonomy does not extend to those questions. So, competition law is not the object of the dispute. It is an incidental question. Conflict rules determine what is applicable beyond the scope of party autonomy. Party autonomy chooses the law applicable to the dispute and other conflict rules will determine the law applicable to the other issues that are not part of the dispute but are in incidental uh, questions. So if competition law is applicable and uh, if the conflict rule shows that uh, EU competition law uh, is uh, the law that is applicable, then the tribunal does not exceed its power when it considers the EU competition law as an incidental matter, in spite of the fact that the contract is subject to the law of the Ruritania. And considering competition law may be necessary in order to avoid rendering an award that violates our, uh, public policy, as we have seen. Now, I will not go through this uh, this slide here because of time constraints, but when I say that public international law, sorry, private international law is important and gives you actually the answer and the basis on which you can uh, find this balance between the two masters, uh, then we have to be aware of the fact that private international law is 
not always, it's not always very clear which private international law applies, among other things, because it is modern and progressive to believe that private international law is not useful, that private international law is a cage, is too formalistic, it's too old-fashioned, it's a reactionary way of thinking the law. Private international law is considered as an ex as the enemy of uh, arbitration, and I think it is a misunderstanding. I think actually private international law is uh, very useful, as this uh, example shows, and, uh, and uh, to the end, in the end of the day, it is more arbitration friendly than not having private international law. In spite of that, you have here some examples of different approaches to which private international law arbitration should accept. The most progressive is what you have in France, in the ICC rules, in many arbitration rules, the voie directe, saying that uh, the arbitral tribunal will jump to the rules of law that they consider applicable without using any conflict rules, without thinking of private international law at all. The, le the, the, the most conservative approach is Norwegian law, which says that uh, in case the parties have not uh, chosen the law, then uh, the arbitral tribunal shall choose the law applicable according to the Norwegian private international law. In the middle, you have the UNCITRAL model law that gives the arbitral tribunal the possibility to choose which conflict rules they will apply. So you have a, different, uh, uh, you have a lot of different uh, uh, approaches. This was as far as uh, the uh, governing law is concerned, the, the uh, choice of law is concerned. As far as the independent legal reasoning is concerned, the example of the corruption, can the arbitral tribunal ex officio decide that this is a contract that is null and void because it is against corruption, when the parties have not raised the, the issue of corruption. And this is an a question that you answer looking at the uh, scope of the powers that the arbitral tribunal has. The arbitral tribunal has a task, a function, which is to solve a dispute on the basis of a legal reasoning. And the legal reasoning that the arbitral tribunal develops is an independent legal reasoning, which is based on the facts and the facts, they are provided by the parties. So the arbitral tribunal cannot invent facts or find facts that the parties have not invoked. But the arbitral tribunal draws inferences from the facts, and that the arbitral tribunal does in an independent way. And the arbitral tribunal ascertains the sources also in an independent way. Only here, the arbitral tribunal has to inform the parties so that none of the parties is taken by surprise. But the point is that the arbitral tribunal's function and power is to draw inferences from the facts presented by the parties and apply the sources to those facts in an independent way. And this is, I think, the second picture, which is not really a picture. This is the cover of a book that Franco Ferrari and I have uh, edited on uh, Jura Novit Curia, the principle according to which the court knows uh, the law and can uh, apply it uh, ex officio without uh, the parting, uh, parties having pleaded it uh, in international arbitration. So, so, so if you are interested, it's 2018, so it's not, uh, it's not very, uh, very old. The limitation to the arbitral tribunal's power to develop its own independent legal reasoning and therefore to investigate issues like corruption, although the parties have not uh, raised those issues. That uh, power has uh, the limitation that I have mentioned, that the parties must not be taken by surprise, so you have to inform the parties and give them the possibility to comment thereon. And then there is a limitation that I don't think I'm going to talk about because we do not have the time. It regards the remedies. So the arbitral tribunal, it is very questionable whether the arbitral tribunal can decide remedies different from the remedies that have been asked by the parties. So it is actually a, hin a, a, a him limping, limping uh, power that the arbitral tribunal has to develop its own legal reasoning and then when it comes to the 
consequence of the legal reasoning, which is the remedies, then they are subject to what the parties have asked in many, in many legal situations, in many legal systems. So, so I will have uh, remedies not requested by the parties. They are not within their powers. Last slide. The tribunal's powers summary. The arbitral tribunal may independently interpret the contract, apply the sources, consider the circumstances, and make inferences. It may make its own independent choice of law, considering party autonomy, of course, but beyond the uh, scope of party autonomy, it can, uh, uh, the arbitral tribunal can determine which law is applicable within the limits of private international law if you want to have a predictable uh, result. You should inform, as an arbitral tribunal, the parties of the sources or the considerations on which the parties may have comments. And the independent legal reasoning does not necessarily permit the tribunal to uh, order remedies that have not been asked by the parties. I think I will stop here because I, I, I understand that we have, uh, yeah, I, I could speak for days, but, uh, but I think I will stop here. <laughs> Thank you. for that excellent presentation. I could listen to you for days, yeah, uh, but thank you that you also stopped and I already see there are a number of questions here. Uh, let's start with Leonora, please, and then you, Mr. Baker. Congratulations, Judith, a great presentation. Um, what about the powers of a tribunal to uh, apply transnational public policy? Uh, once I was in a conference, ICA conference, and there was a debate between Katharine Kessigian, professor, French professor, and Jan Paulson, and she would say that tribunals should take into consideration uh, transnational public policy whenever the applicable law does not provide for such uh, issue as a mandatory or public issue, and, and Jan Paulson was against it, and she said, Transnational public policy is like a white elephant. When it's in the room, you know it and you should take it to, into consideration. What's your opinion about that? Well, thank you. Um, having to choose sides between Catherine uh, Kasejan and Jan Paulson is not easy. So I think I will choose my own side here. And uh, with transnational public policy, I'm not so sure that it exists, actually. But... Uh, but uh, like everyone is speaking about international public policy, but if you read French court decisions when they apply international public policy, they always say that they apply French international public policy. And they use the term international to distinguish the French international public policy from the French domestic public policy, which covers also overriding mandatory rules. So, so it's a question of terminology. It's always national public policy. But the point uh, that probably Katrin was making is that uh, there are uh, uh, some principles that are recognized in a large number of, uh, of states and so on. And uh, for those principles, I'm not so sure that you need to take into consideration the fact that they are uh, transnational. Um, that's where the private international law would help you to take into consideration the overriding mandatory rules, those only that have the quality of becoming public policy uh, in the context where they could become public policy. You take them into consideration not because they are transnational, but be because they have some sort of connection with the dispute that justifies their consideration. And uh, that would be more predictable than uh, just deciding that this is a principle that everyone likes and therefore I apply it. I think it's better to have a principle that is closely connected with the dispute. There are a number of questions. We start with Mr. Becker, then we have Ben Steinberg, then we have Mr. Seelmann and then Carsten. Thank you very much for your, um, for your talk. Uh, I liked it very much and it was really a pleasure to, to hear you. Nevertheless, um, I had, concerning the first issue that you have presented to us, I had some difficulties to follow you. I thought that the solution might be much more easy. 
And I thought that the solution might already reside in the name of private international law. It's private international law. And if there is a possibility of choice of law, this possibility only covers private law. And I have the impression that competition law is considered to be public law, just as criminal law or um, tax law or other branches of public law. And so I, th I always thought to solve these, 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 these issues should be solved in that way, that you say, well, they chose the law of Mauritania, but nevertheless, it's a case that resides in the European Union, and therefore, everything that is public law in the European Union directly applies, whatever their choice of private international law may be. What is your opinion to this? Thank you. Yes, of course. Uh, these are uh, issues, competition law, tax law, corruption as well, actually. They are uh, all issues that, uh, that are of uh, public law. What I was thinking about were the uh, civil law consequences of these laws on the contract. So whether the contract is valid or not is actually a civil law, private law. Uh, issue and uh, when the parties say but this contract is not valid under the law of Ruritania it's invalid under EU competition law but EU competition law is uh, not applicable to the civil law this is what the parties say not what I say well um, perhaps there might be different conceptions of what you consider as private law and public law but um, my conception would be um, it is private law a private law uh, rule says if there is public law who says this is void, we declare it void as private law. So maybe proletarian law says this, and then we have to go to public to the applicable public law, and that is the law of the EU. But maybe there are different concepts. It it's not necessary, I can answer very quickly while you go to the next <laughs> question. It's not necessarily a very different, uh, um, it's a different point of view, but the point is the same, that what the parties chose, the law of Ruritania, has limits. And uh, those limits, they are uh, the uh, contractual and tort issues that, uh, that the parties can dispose of. And uh, whatever is outside of those limits, is subject is not subject to the law that the parties have chosen. I have a question on the second case. You mentioned the corruption case, and I was surprised that you mentioned that the tribunal should consider whether to render an award at all. I thought when a tribunal becomes aware of a corruption case, then it should rather step down and not act at all. So is that really an issue of how to and what kind of award the tribunal should render, or isn't that rather a question of whether the tribunal shouldn't become involved in a corruption scheme? Yeah, this is, thank you so much. This is, you have one week available for, uh, for the answer here. Um, you are some, probably taking, uh, making reference to Judge Lagergren's decision of 1963, I think it was, where he said that uh, uh, here it's a matter of uh, corruption and uh, arbitration should not lend its hand uh, to these things and I uh, will step down. Um, what he was doing there was correct because in that particular situation the parties instructed him not to consider the issue of corruption. And if the parties instruct an arbitrator not to do something, then the arbitrator would exceed its power if it did what the party is instructed not to do. Therefore, since the arbitrator does not want to lend its hands to, uh, to corruption, then the only possible si mm, solution is to step down. But there are other issues, other situations where you can imagine that uh, uh, maybe one party was not aware of the fact that uh, the contract uh, could be considered uh, void and therefore the arbitral tribunal can uh, uh, bring up the issue ex officio and ask whether the parties have comments and then the party who may be interested in uh, 
in, uh, in, in pleading that the contract is void could jump on the uh, occasion and, and do that. In such a case, the arbitral tribunal would not exceed its power because it would be a request by one party. That has been initiated by the arbitral tribunal itself, but it would still be part of the, of the proceedings. So there are many different situations, and uh, resigning is only, I think, uh, the right solution when the parties instruct the arbitral tribunal not to consider corruption. And if you look at investment arbitration, there is a lot of case law there. Uh, there is a lot of confusion of terminology. Uh, in some cases, uh, they say that uh, issues of corruption affect uh, admissibility of the claim. In other cases, they say they affect the jurisdiction. In other cases, they say they affect the arbitrability. And in yet other cases, they go and decide on the merits. So, and it's not necessarily, not making a decision is not necessarily the right thing to do in case the money, depending on who is keeping the money of, of the bribe. So, so it's, it's also a very case sensitive issue, actually. Yes, thank you, Sebastian Silman. And this sort of follows on from what you just said. I, in, in investment arbitration, there is a growing body of decisions that uh, find that a tribunal has to take into account issues of corruption ex officio, even if the state has never investigated, for example, the alleged corruption. And I, I query whether that is consistent with what you said about there not being an international policy um, or such a thing as international public policy. I mean, to me, that is an example of an international public policy which is independent of the national law of the states, particularly if you have an exit, uh, exit arbitration where national law is not of, of real importance. Thank you. International public policy is, uh, exists to the extent that uh, there are some issues of public policy that, uh, that you find in many different states and uh, where there is a consensus, uh, such a consensus that even the Court of Appeal of Paris uh, has decided to take the maximalist approach and so on. But uh, when it comes down to, when, when you look at the, the decisions of the uh, Paris Court of Appeal, they will make reference to the French public policy. So, so I'm not sure that it is really useful to, to operate with this category of international or uh, transnational public policy. Uh, I guess I could, I also agree with you that something like transnational public policy is not very helpful. But international public policy, which is, na which is national public policy, can have different sources. And if the source of the national, international public policy uh, is from word law, from a principle which is common to most legal systems, as in the case of corruption, I guess it's easier for an uh, arbitral tribunal to say, yes, let's apply it. Because actually, the case you didn't uh, deal with, uh, sanctions and anti-sanctions, it's much more difficult for an uh, arbitral tribunal to, 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 to tell which public law do I apply. Uh, the public law of the state who says, I forbid you to fulfill that contract, or the public law of the other state which says, I forbid you to follow the country forbidding the fulfillment of the contract. And, and therefore, do you have any idea, do you have conflict of law rules for that situation or how, that, uh, how should an arbitral tribunal uh, uh, act in that situation? Yeah, you are absolutely right. Uh, national public policy can also come from international sources, absolutely. The, the European uh, Convention on Human Rights, for example, or many other... Uh, uh, sanctions, a lot of other examples could be made. And of course it is easier for an arbitral tribunal to apply sources uh, when they have international origin than to apply national sources because it's, uh, we know that the climate is against uh, domestic or national uh, statalism and so on. So, so it's, uh, if the sources have an international origin it's, uh, it's much better. But they are still domestic public policy. <laughs> The case of the sanctions. Would you apply then if you have contradicting public policies and maybe both uh, jurisdictions have uh, uh, relation to the case? Mm. Um, I was reading just uh, just the other day something about uh, 
uh, if there, are, there is a conflict between overriding mandatory rules or if there is a conflict between public, public policies, uh, then the arbitral tribunal shall strive to interpret each of the rules and policies in a way that uh, are compatible with each other. So my, my, my response there is good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Judith. That was a very good final part of that session. Um, um, it was very interesting, as I said, that we could probably go on. You have another 10 minutes to go on during the coffee break. We are a little bit behind. I would ask you to shorten the coffee break a little bit. Be here at half past. That means you're probably here by five past, half past. And uh, then we go on with the final part. Thank you again for, for that presentation. So welcome back, uh, sorry for the small delay, uh, but once you have the opportunity to discuss issues in person, it's very difficult to get people to continue in time. Uh, that is now the final part of our conference, uh, and that is usually what we call the Wismut part, where we have someone discussing in abstract a little bit the problem underlying the, this year's Wismut problem. And uh, there would be hardly anyone better suited for that than uh, Professor Milena Djordjevic. Milena is a good old friend from Serbia. She is assistant professor at the uh, University of Belgrade and center for, uh, director of the Center for Legal Skills at the university. She teaches inter alia international commercial law and arbitration and holds a degree not only from Belgrade but also from Pittsburgh and LLM and so has a good understanding of both civil law and common law. Um, she often acts as arbitrator, but is probably known to most of you who follow that as the organizer of the Belgrade Premoot, which is for many teams usually a highlight in the Premoot season just before they go to Vienna. And they were one of the few which were held in person and um, I think there's a competition presently who is a bigger super spread event, the Paris Arbitration Week or the Belgrade Premoot. Uh, but Milena, thank you very much that you nevertheless took the time to prepare despite the Premoot only finishing uh, on Sunday evening. And we are listening towards having the final input on the problem of this year's arbitration or this year's uh, Wismut case the law applicable to the arbitration agreement. Milena, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stefan. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it is wonderful to be here, despite the fact that I would have preferred seeing you in person and having coffee with you just a few moments ago. I also hope that I would have the opportunity to visit Butserius once again and the city of Hamburg, where I've spent many months on my research for the doctoral thesis on the CSG. Yet, the organization of an in-person conference and the Belgrade Open Premoot that gathered 50 teams from 25 different countries took its toll. So did the uncertainties about the COVID regulations applicable to Germany and my double Chinese vaccine plus Pfizer booster. Anyhow, I'm delighted to be here with you today and I hope that the virtual format of my participation will not prevent the discussion at the end of my presentation. So as Stefan just told you a few months ago, he called me and asked me to give a presentation on the law governing the arbitration agreement. He made it clear that it is relevant for this year's mood problem and that my topic of my presentation will be of some use for, for the, this year's mootings. I'm also convinced that for the rest of you in the audience who are not taking part in the moot, you'll find the topic interesting as it indeed is one of the evergreen topics of arbitration and given the recent case law uh, on different sides of the planet, it is still a hot topic. You've heard people calling it too academic, but nobody disputes that it has important practical considerations. And these practical and academic considerations have been drafted in the procedural order number one of this year's moot problem as the following question. Have the parties validly agreed on the jurisdiction of the arbitration tribunal? What is the law applicable to the arbitration agreement? And is the CSG applicable to the conclusion of the arbitration agreement in the event that this law is governed by the law of Mediterraneo, which is the CSG uh, contracting state? Upon reading Stefan's recent article published in 
Ichaer, it became clear to me that the specific issues were prompted, at least to the later question, by a recent decision of the German Supreme Court, the so-called Ground Mace case, where I'm convinced that the inspiration for the former question is somehow impacted by, again, a recent judgment of the UK Supreme Court in Enka versus Chat. In the mentioned article, Stefan discussed the subject matter of my presentation today and the relevant case law and has underlined, and I quote, Stefan, this is a Google translation of your article. I hope it is correct. It is to be hoped that the almost 3,000 students who will deal with the problem as part of this year's Wismut um, courts, beyond all considerations of practicability, justify their solutions better than the German Supreme Court. End of quote. I hope that he does not bear the same expectations from my presentation today. I do not dare to promise such an outcome. So what are the practical and legal considerations relevant for my topic? We all know that international sales contracts by great majority include a dispute resolution clause calling for arbitration. Everyone, of course, knows that arbitration agreement is the very foundation for arbitration and that without a valid agreement, there is no arbitration or at least the award brought in such a procedure would be later subject to set aside. In order to sustain the jurisdiction of the arbitration tribunals, the tribunals often have to answer the following questions. Did the parties validly conclude the agreement? Did they adhere to applicable form requirements? How should the agreement be interpreted? What is its scope? And so on and so forth. The parties often include in their international sales contract a provision on applicable law to the contract. They also often in most cases, choose the seat of arbitration. But how often do they opt for a law applicable to arbitration agreement? The factual overview of the cases available to us shows that it's a very, very small percentage of contracts that contain such a provision. Why is this so? What's the reason for such an omission when they pay due regard to the applicable substantive law, law applicable to the contract and with the seat of arbitration? Is this somehow impacted by parties not um, making a difference between the main contract and the arbitration clause that is contained therein? Or do they perhaps tie the importance to the importance of the seat, the law applicable to the arbitration agreement? The cases that we are going to analyze today will perhaps give us some light on this issue. Uh, before going into the comparative overview of how this issue is perceived today, I would just like to point out a few cases that I had in my own arbitration practice, and we'll come back to them when we discuss the issue, what do parties actually have in mind when negotiating arbitration clauses. So I've had a case with a Belarusian and, between a Belarusian and Serbian entity where the law of Belarus was the applicable law, the seat was in Stockholm, and the rules that the parties opted for were the rules of the Swedish Arbitration Institute. Then in a different case, between Latvian and Serbian entity, the Serbian law was applied or chosen, the seat was in Vienna, and VIAC rules applied. Another case is between Serbian and Nigerian entity, where the Nigerian law was opted for the law applicable to the merits of the case, the seat in Zurich, and the ICC rules. And a case between Italian and Serbian entity, where the Serbian law applied, seat was in Vienna, and the applicable rules were the, the ones of the International Commercial Chamber uh, of, and, and their Court of Arbitration in Paris. So were any of these selections a consequence of a conscious process or not, will be revealed to you um, at a later stage of this presentation. So going back to the topic of presentation law applicable to arbitration agreement. Is this an easy question? I mean, do we all know the answer to this question? Is there uniformity on a global level in this regard? The only common denominator for all jurisdictions, to the best of my understanding, is that where the parties expressly agree on the law applicable to arbitration agreement, then such law prevails. So that's a non-issue. So what we'll be actually be discussing today is what happens when the parties do not agree on the law applicable to arbitration agreement. A comparative overview of different jurisdictions around the globe uh, conducted by Maxi Scherer and Ola Janssen shows that in most countries, the relevant law in such situations would be the law of the seat of arbitration. Uh, by, 
a preponderant part of jurisdictions, 51% to be precise, call for the law of the seat. The law of the main contract, on the other hand, is applied in 34% of jurisdictions. 9% of jurisdictions follow the validation principle and 6% and so-called a national approach. So the law of the seat is more likely to apply in Latin America, Nigeria, Egypt, China, and Russia, whereas the law of the main contract is more likely to apply in England, Canada, India, Pakistan, Iran, Singapore. The validation principle is followed, of course, by Switzerland, Netherlands, Spain, Portugal, Peru, and a national approach is followed in France, Algeria, Mauritius, among other countries. What this overview shows to us is that there is no internationally accepted rule on the law applicable to arbitration agreement. And this is in stark contrast with the reasoning of the Yanka Chab decision previously mentioned, where actually the courts in their reasoning um, state that what they have uh, found in that particular case is something that reflects the internationally accepted view. And with this being said, let's just remember um, a, a few facts of that case. Uh, the case started uh, with the, the, the factual overview of fire in a power plant in Siberia, where insurer Chubb, who was subrogated um, uh, uh, for the loss uh, compensated to the main contractor who had an agreement with subcontractor Enka, a Turkish entity, who allegedly was liable for these um, uh, consequences. So the insurer sued Enka at, before the court in Moscow to establish liability, whereas Enka protested that uh, the court is not, does not have jurisdiction to decide the issue because there's a valid arbitration agreement in a contract between Enka and the main contractor. As a consequence, Enka sued in London for anti-suit injunction and declaration that a valid arbitration agreement exists. Based on the facts of the case, the arbitration clause provided for seat in London, but had no reference to applicable law, either applicable to the merits or to the arbitration agreement whatsoever. Allegedly, if the court were to find that the applicable law to arbitration agreement is English law, then claims brought before Moscow court would fall under the arbitration clause. Whereas if the court is to find that the applicable law to arbitration agreement is Russian law, which might have been the case based on the alleged implied choice of Russian law, then the claims brought before Moscow court would fall outside the arbitration agreement. And this was, this was the factual um, pattern that brought the issue into question and the need to establish what the law applicable to arbitration agreement is, because deciding on this issue will affect the decision on anti-suit injunction and the decision and declaration on the validity of arbitration agreement. Uh, the Supreme Court, in, in establishing uh, a juris well, in establishing the validity of arbitration agreement, in that case based on the fact that the arbitration agreement is valid under the law of the seat, in its reasoning explained several um, paths that the tribunals and judges should take into account in the future when deciding on this issue. And as a starting point, uh, of course, the court confirmed that when there is an explicit agreement as to the law applicable to arbitration agreement, such law should prevail. But if there is no explicit agreement as to the law applicable to arbitration agreement, the Supreme Court in UK found that there is an implied presumption that the law of the contract applies to the arbitration clause. And that the only exceptions to, to, to such a factual scenario could be if the law of the contract would invalidate the clause, so they introduced or reaffirmed the validation principle, or if the law of the seat states that it applies to arbitration agreement, as is the case, for example, in Sweden, and I, I, I think in Scotland as well. Where there is no law agreed by the parties, either for the arbitration agreement or for the main contract, then the court says the law of the seat applies as the law of the closest connection. 
But this does not put an end to, to understanding and reading of the Anka versus Chubb decision because it was made by majority and with two significant dissenting opinions uh, with respect to the reasoning that the court um, used. So the dissenting opinion actually states that the um, law of the contract is the implied law of the arbitration agreement or the most closely connected law to the arbitration agreement. So what the dissenting um, judges stated is that the majority is wrong when saying that in the absence of an applicable arbitration agreement or to the contract, it's the law of the sea that prevails. To them, it is still the law of the contract that is more closely connected to the arbitration agreement. So what this decision shows to us is the lack of certainty and unified approach even among the US Supreme Court, UK Supreme Court judges and let alone around the globe between the courts of the dif different um, jurisdictions. The question of the law applicable to arbitration agreement can, many authors have uh, rightly stated, um, or the answer to the question depends on who, when, and how asks the question. Because uh, the question might be answered differently if it's the arbit arbitration tribunal that answers the question or if it's the judges before the national courts. Then again, the question might be answered differently if it's asked before the arbitration procedure. For example, in a case like, like in Anka case when uh, somebody is trying to compel the other party to arbitrate during the arbitration proceedings when an arbitral tribunal is deciding on its jurisdiction or after the proceedings, for example, in the set-aside uh, proceedings or the enforcement proceedings. And again, it depends on the question as well, because it's too easy to say that there is one law applicable to arbitration agreement, because the question of the applicable law to arbitration agreement might arise in many different contexts. So one might uh, say that the arbitration agreement is not valid and invoke duress, for example, as a reason for its invalidity. Then we have to find a law applicable to substantive validity of arbitration agreement. It might be a different case if somebody disputes the validity of arbitration agreement based on the fact that it's concluded orally. Then, obviously, it's a matter of formal validity. Then the question might arise within the concepts of what did the parties actually say? What did they want to say? And we turn to the question of interpretation. The questions go on and go on, and, uh, and the, the list um, may be uh, much longer than the time that we have to, to um, discuss the matters. But then again, the matter of scope, the matter of uh, whether the, the agreement extends to third parties, and so on and so forth, all these questions should be answered by the law applicable to the arbitration agreement. So what is the legal framework for answering these questions? And in this respect, again, most, uh, most courts and arbitrators and authors agree that the party's int intent remains decisive. So if the parties agree on the applicable law, then that law should prevail. And then if the, the agreement is lacking, it should be the other objective factors, such as the law of the closest connection but where the courts and authors disagree is when it comes to the party's intent being implied, should it be implied from the fact that they agreed on the law applicable to the merits or should the implied intent come from their agreement on the seat of arbitration? Likewise, when it comes to the law of the closest connection, judges and authors disagree whether the seat or the law applicable to the main contract are more closely connected to the arbitration agreement. Nobody disputes that the New York Convention is relevant to answer this question. And Article 5.1a of the New York Convention contains a useful conflict of law rules when it comes to the law applicable to the arbitration agreement. And just to quote the convention, uh, one of the reasons why recognition and enforcement of arbitral award may be denied is when the said agreement, arbitration agreement, from which was the, the, the bone stone of the arbitration proceedings, is not valid under the law to which the parties have subjected it, or failing any indication thereon, 
under the law of the country where the award was made. So in summary, the New York Convention confirms the express, implied choice of uh, the law applicable to arbitration agreement and the relevance of the seat as, the, as the, the objective factor of the closest connection of arbitration agreement to, to an, an external um, factor, thus leading us to the applicable arbitration law. Um, it is, again, if we go back to the wording of Article 5.1.8, it is clear that it mentions only validity uh, of the arbitration agreement, whereas there are other questions that might be asked when it comes to the law applicable to arbitration agreement. And again, a survey conducted by our colleagues Sherry and, and Janssen shows that in 50% of cases decided under New York Convention, the courts limited the application of this conflict of law rules only to the matters of validity of arbitration agreement. But in another half of cases, the 50%, the courts expanded the application of the conflict of law rules that I have previously read out to you to matters of law applicable to arbitration agreement that go beyond the validity of arbitration agreement. Many authors have also asked whether we should take into account, I mean, New York Convention governs what happens after arbitration procedure. Uh, these provisions are relevant in the context of enforcement and recognition of foreign arbitral awards. Should we pay due regard to the same considerations before and during the arbitration proceedings? And in most cases, the answer is affirmative. The uniformity of the conflict of law rules and the law applicable to arbitration agreement and the ensuing results and the purpose of the New York Convention itself can only be achieved if the same criteria are regarded as relevant before, during, and after the arbitration proceedings. So what the survey of the relevant case law and doctrine shows to us is that there are three important questions to be answered in this regard. And this is where also the differences come uh, into play. One is whether a choice of law clause for the main contract extends automatically to arbitration agreement as an ex express agreement on that law to govern the arbitration agreement. In some jurisdictions, this question is answered in affirmative. So they say whenever the parties choose the law applicable to the main contract, they have in itself chosen the law applicable to arbitration agreement, which forms part of the said contract. Arbitration agreement is just another clause in the agreement and parties had no intention to differentiate between applicable laws to arbitration agreement and the remaining provisions of the agreement. There are many authors, and you will not be surprised, who are who opposed to such a view. And they often invoke separability as a defense to such an understanding. They say it's a common rule of the arbitration law that an arbitration clause which forms part of the contract should be treated as an agreement independent of the other terms of the contract. Then those in favor of a unified approach on the law applicable to the contract, including the arbitration clause, they say, well, yes, separability um, exists indeed, but it's not the purpose of separability to have different laws applicable to arbitration agreement and other clauses in the contract. The purpose of separability is to allow the tribunal to decide on a matter of jurisdiction even when uh, the um, uh, existence or validity of a main contract in which the arbitration agreement is contained is disputed. The second question that can be answered or should be answered in this context is what happens when a choice of law clause or whether a choice of law clause um, and the law applicable according to the choice of law clause can be extended to arbitration agreement as an implied agreement of the parties. If we disagree that there's an express choice in the provision calling for, let's say, Serbian law to apply to the sales contract that contains a DIS arbitration clause, can we at least say then that there is an implied agreement for the Serbian law to govern the arbitration agreement as well? And again, some might oppose uh, this uh, assumption on the basis of separability. Others will say that this is a very artificial distinction, that it's also a, it's a result or creation uh, 
of bright legal minds, but it has no effect in the eyes of the parties. The parties do not deem that the arbitration agreement is something separate from the main contract. And when they agree on the applicable law to the contract, they also agree on, the, on such law to govern the arbitration agreement. What do parties have in mind when they negotiate the contract? Um, rarely, uh, well, sometimes uh, comes to, to, to the light of the day and sometimes we are uh, in a position to understand that, but more often than not, uh, this is uh, not the case. And if we have an arbitration clause, um, if we have a contract that stipulates that the Serbian law will apply to the contract and the contract contains a DIS uh, or calls for application of DIS rules and the seat of arbitration is in Hamburg, why would we presume if we follow, follow the implied choice of the substantive law of contract, why would we presume that the parties had in mind for the Serbian law to apply to arbitration agreement as well and not only to the matters of parties' rights and obligations and performance of the contract? Is it just a mere coincidence that the parties have opted for Hamburg as the seat of arbitration and for the DAS rules, or should it be attached less importance than the reference to the Serbian applicable law? I would say no, but let, let's see with the, some of the examples from my practice, how actually parties uh, thought of this issue themselves. ANCA decision, on the other hand, would say that the parties choosing Serbian law as the law applicable to the contract will actually mean that they have opted for the Serbian law to apply to the arbitration agreement calling for arbitration under DIS rules in Hamburg. Uh, when it comes to the matter of the closest connection for arbitration agreement, and this works only on the assumption that no law applicable to arbitration agreement was chosen and no law applicable to the main contract was chosen. So there's no choice of law whatsoever. And there, uh, the question is, so what law applies then? Then it's the law of the seat, according to the New York Convention, and the seat being the objective factor that is most closely connected to the arbitration agreement. But then again, there are many countries that deem that the most closely connected law to the arbitration agreement, again, is not the law of the seat, but the law of the main contract. Uh, and it's based on the same uh, understanding that the arbitration clause is just another clause in the, the, this big main contract and that the commercial parties do not differentiate between uh, these legal doctrines that we take into account as arbitration practitioners and academics. There are also other courts which deem that the law of the contract is the most closely related to the law of arbitration agreement and ignore the importance, I, I must say, ignore the importance of parties' selection of the seat. And as a professor of arbitration law, um, one of the topics that I teach at the beginning of the course to my student is the importance of the place of arbitration, which um, is reflected by several, in, in several different matters including the fact that the arbitration award bears the nationality of the seat of arbitration, then that the seat's courts play an important law, a role in constituting the arbitration tribunal, for example, in ad hoc arbitration. Uh, they also take part in decisions on challenges of arbitrators in ad hoc arbitration. They're there to help in um, um, getting evidence uh, set right on, on certain occasions. Uh, then again, they might have a power to decide on uh, jurisdiction of the tribunal. Uh, in a, upon the arbitral tribunal has made its decision, the party may have a recourse to the state court to confirm or deny the finding of the arbitral tribunal. And of course, uh, once the arbitration procedure is complete and the award is made, the court of the seat of arbitration has a controlling function in a set-aside uh, proceedings. Thus, one really cannot ignore the importance of the seat of arbitration for the arbitration agreement and the procedure that comes on the basis of such arbitration agreement. And most importantly, again, if we go back to the wording of Article 501A of the New York Convention that now applies in, in so many countries of the world, uh, 
um, one, it is kind of difficult to defend a position that attributes greater weight to the law of the main contract than to the law of the seat, seat being the uh, most closely connected um, objective factor to the arbitration agreement. And to summarize, based on the judgments that I have read and the articles that I, that I have read, and again, based on the 34% of the jurisdictions throughout the world, the arguments in favor of the law of the contract have been structured so to provide a more commercial, commercially sound approach. They say parties intend the whole contract to be governed by the same law. They don't perceive arbitration agreement as something different. Again, separability is just a legal doctrine created by splendid legal minds, but unfamiliar to commercial parties. And, um, and they, what they want is not to exclude the arbitration agreement from the main contract, but only to have a procedure in place, even if contract is ineffective. On the other hand, 51% of jurisdictions that opts in favor of the law of the seat to be applied under such uh, conditions, state that the law of the seat offers clarity and a straightforward, easy solution to the question of what, what law applies to arbitration agreement. All other solutions lack such clarity and are more difficult. Uh, and if we remember the, the anchor judgment again, which requires you to go into the analysis of what the law applicable to main agreement says, or whether it does or does not invalidate the arbitration agreement, and then going into looking at the law of the seat and seeing what that law states with respect to the law applicable to arbitration agreement before actually reaching a decision which law applies, we can agree, I hope, that the law of the seat indeed offers much easier and straightforward solution. And certainty indeed is something that the business community requires. And in that respect, I think it does meet commercial interests as well. So going back to the examples that I have given to you from, from my practice, what were the reasons why Belarusian and Serbian entity who opted for law of Belarus, why did they choose a seat in Stockholm and the Swedish Arbitration Institute rules? And what did they have in mind when making uh, such uh, contractual clauses? Did they intend the law of Belarus to apply to arbitration agreement? Or were they more inclined into Swedish law as applicable to the matter of arbitration agreement if certain questions arise? based on the interviews conducted with these parties, and my involvement was, was not of an arbitrator, is that they actually were aware of the separability doctrine, and they were aware of the fact that the law of the seat trumps the law of the contract when it comes to arbitration agreements, unless otherwise expressly stipulated by the parties. What considerations drew Italian and Serbian entity to agree on Serbian law as the law applicable to the contract and seat in Vienna under ICC rules. In this case, the reasoning why Vienna was chosen was twofold. On the one hand, it was perceived as a cheaper venue than the usual Paris being the seat of ICC, um, well, the seat the, where the building is, in that respect, the seat of the ICC Court of Arbitration, or being a cheaper venue than Switzerland, which is again another country that usually attracts parties who agree on ICC rules and come from the neighborhood where I come from. So for them, Vienna was a more affordable option. And uh, also they took into account the fact that the awards made in Vienna will be subject to one round of uh, control by the state courts, which also uh, will be and that it's kind of deterrent to, to go and attempt to set aside such an award because the Austria courts have high fees um, that you need to, to pay for to the courts uh, when you initiate set aside proceedings. Again, did they at any point in time think that because the Serbian law governs the main contract, the arbitration agreement is also going to be subject to the Serbian law? The answer is clear, no. So, in these specific cases, I mean, the parties actually intended that choosing the, the seat, they also choose the law applicable to arbitration agreement. Um, maybe not in these specific 
uh, in these specific uh, lines of, of arguments. Maybe they were not you know, clever enough. But then again, I don't think that we should disregard the fact that the parties who agree on arbitration are aware of certain consequences that agreeing of, on the seat of arbitration bears. And that it's, in my mind, more likely that even if we are going to uh, ascertain this hypothetical intent of the parties, more arguments go in favor of the application of the law of the seat than in favor of the application of the law of the contract. And usually it's the hypothetical will of the parties that is being invoked as an argument in favor of law of the contract in jurisdictions that follow this approach. And uh, the last question that I have uh, decided to pose and hopefully answer to some extent, which is related to this year's moot problem, is what happens if the law applicable to arbitration agreement is the law of the country that has ratified the CSG? Can then the CSG be the law that gives answers to the question of interpretation of arbitration agreement and the formation of arbitration agreement? Or is CSG something distinct from the arbitration world and uh, ca can apply only to sales contracts and the provisions that um, are usually expected to be in regard to the sales transaction and other dispute resolution process? So again, on the comparative level or global level, level what is the situation we have today? Uh, well, we have a situation of great uh, disagreement among scholars. Uh, to start with that. And um, some authors have actually qualified them under different uh, groups that follow different approaches. And again, my dear friend, uh, Stefan Kroll, is by at least one of the, the, the scholars identified as being a part of the rejectionists group. Allegedly, Stefan is completely opposed to CSG applying to arbitration agreements even for the questions or, uh, of interpretation and formation, whereas I think everyone will follow his view that the formal validity of arbitration agreement cannot be discussed under the CSG. Again, some are also of the view, uh, Stefan, I just need to pass the word to you because our keynote speaker here in Belgrade, Professor Ingeborg Schwenzer, uh, is of the opinion that you are slowly changing your mind in that regard, or at least she's hoping that you are, uh, which is the usual, um, again, hope of the other group of CAG scholars. Uh, you may call them expansionists. And here I'm not saying that on this particular issue, Ingeborg Fall is in this group, although there might be other issues. Where, where she qualifies as an expansionist. Uh, but there are authors who actually think that the CSG can govern all matters regarding the arbitration agreement, including its formal validity. Uh, this um, opinion was expressed in one article of Professor Janet Walker from 2006, although later on she did change her mind and I think put this uh, bold statement in more relative terms. Um, so it is very rare nowadays to find authors who would opt for CSG freedom of form provision to apply on arbitration agreements, even though um, the law of the seat and even the law of the contract might be the countries uh, that call for the written form of arbitration agreement. Finally, the majority of authors, and it may even be the courts, to the best of what we know now, goes for the middle ground. They say uh, something in between. So CSG applies to the matters of formation and interpretation of the arbitration agreement, but of course it cannot apply to the matters of validity. So how, do have, how, how have they come to this um, understanding? Um, again, you, you can go and look at the provisions of the CSG and see how it defines its scope of application. And again, you can see a reference in Article 4 that it applies to matters of formation and performance of the CSG contract and only those matters. Um, then again, arbitration agreements are not uh, usually considered as something that, that is um, a part of obligation of either of the seller or the buyer. They're not specific to the parties, to the international uh, sales contract. And uh, nevertheless, the arbitration agreements or the dispute uh, resolution mechanism is mentioned in Articles 19.3 and Articles 18.1.1. Uh, the, the latter is in the section that deals with the avoidance of the contract and confirms that in case of termination of the international sales agreement uh, 
the arbitration clause or dispute resolution clause is not impacted and that provision still stands. Whereas 19.3 speaks um, of the uh, offers and counter offers and what elements in this process may affect um, an acceptance to be an acceptance and instead be a counter offer. And again, dispute resolution clauses are mentioned there. So is this sufficient um, to make the CSG uh, uh, as law applicable to arbitration agreement only or even to the matters of interpretation and formation of uh, arbitration agreement? In the opinion of the recent uh, decision of the German Supreme Court, the answer is yes. But then, as my dear friend Stefan says, the court does not perhaps offer us enough reasons on, on why it has based in decision, its decision on um, such an understanding. I will leave it at, at this. Uh, I understand that soon you have closing remarks, and I, I assume that we, there might be questions that you want to discuss with me. So here I am. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to further discussion. Thank you, Melena, for your excellent presentation on the various issues. Uh, the rule here is that normally we do not discuss the CSG uh, presentation, yeah, because you fortunately left one of the questions open. But nevertheless, I really enjoyed your presentation because all the examples were with Hamburg and the DIS. Yeah? Uh, we haven't paid you for that, yeah? that you make a little bit of marketing for the DIS, we, but we highly appreciate that. And we are glad that we're also sponsoring the Belgrade pre -mood. With that, and before I pass on to uh, my friend Ulrike Umbeck for closing remarks from the uh, Hamburg Arbitration Circle, I would take the opportunity to thank two people without whom that event would not have been possible, apart from all the speakers. And these are my two assistants, uh, Mr. Thilo Kerkhoff and Mr. Mesut Akbaba. So thank you very much for doing all the work. You can also stand up that the people recognize you. With that, I'll also thank all the speakers on behalf of the uh, Center for International Dispute Resolution at Bucerius. I thank all the participants here in the room at, as well as online. And I now pass on to Elke for the final remarks, closing remarks. Yeah, thank you very much, Stefan. First of all, I would like to thank you uh, for organizing this event. I thank you and the Buceas Law School for hosting this event and uh, this conference. It's really good to see so many familiar faces and new faces. And I sincerely hope that next year we will even have a broader event uh, uh, with much more people uh, coming here, and uh, in particular all the students um, which we will see uh, tomorrow online. Uh, as a matter of fact, my closing remarks are actually opening remarks, opening remarks for the sixth Camp CBC Hamburg Premoot, which will be uh, um, which is scheduled for tomorrow uh, afternoon in light of uh, the uh, different time zones. So, uh, as Eleonora Coelho already mentioned, uh, this year we had an overwhelming success. We received uh, more than 120 applications from uh, teams all over the world, and we had uh, the difficult task to choose. Uh, at the end, uh, we have 42 uh, teams participating in the pre uh linked to 21 Hamburg law firms. So that is also a record, uh, 21 uh, participating Hamburg law firms, full service law, international law firms, full service law firms, boutique law firms, uh, quite a range of different uh, uh, law firms. And um, I take the uh, occasion to uh, thank all the participating law firms um, yeah, to be uh, available tomorrow. Um, I thank my regards on behalf of the Hamburg Arbitration Circle, uh, which is organizing the um, Hamburg Premoot since now 12 years. 
We started with a very few number of participating teams and uh, thanks to the CANCBC, um, we enlarged that and um, yeah, thank you uh, Eleonora, thank you your team, Luisa Kümmel, uh, Anna, uh, for their efforts in organizing uh, this event and uh, having so much uh, email traffic with teams, arbitrators, uh, with me uh, uh, for organizing uh, this pre-mode. Yeah, we are, um, we are happy to have the pre in Hamburg, of course. I think Hamburg, uh, that has to be mentioned, uh, is an ideal uh, seat and place for arbitrations. Uh, um, the 21 law firms already, uh, already underline this, uh, that we have a uh, um, very vivid um, arbitration scene here in, in Hamburg. Actually, in, uh, uh, um, I was asked previously how many members we have in the Hamburg Arbitration Circle. We have around uh, 80 members now, individual practitioners, uh, which are carefully selected, <laughs> only the ones uh, who actually have the arbitration experience. Uh, um, so lawyers, but also some judges, uh, counsel from, uh, uh, from businesses. Um, Hamburg has a really long arbitration tradition. Yeah? It goes back to the Hanseatic League. That's why we called the Premoot first uh, Hanseatic Premoot. Uh, already in these times, uh, commercial uh, commercials had the, uh, the the desire to have unified uh, principles, unified laws and rules for their business. Uh, with some kind of predictability, and uh, um, they had their own uh, jurisdiction. So uh, from, uh, from these past times on, we have a long uh, tradition here in Hamburg um, due to the, to, um, the large harbor and a um, lot of uh, commodities coming in. So we have different commodity arbitrations, but uh, Nowadays, with, um, you know, we, as a hotspot for renewables uh, and logistics, um, we offer a lot of uh, other arbitration centers as well. The Latin American uh, Arbitration Center, the Chinese European Arbitration Center, um, the rules of the Hamburg uh, um, Chamber of Commerce, um, the now uh, Hamburg International Arbitration Centers with also nice um, hearing rooms. So, uh, that uh, close my remarks. Thanks again to all participating teams. Thank you for the participating law firms, the KMCBC, um, for all uh, the support. And again, I sincerely hope to see you next year, not only online, but here present in Hamburg. Thank you. Thank you.